very happy birthday to to the group. And uh, so this is a celebration of uh, the group as well as uh, the all the members uh, who've been part of this group uh, for a very long time. And we started off with a, as a small group, and now we are uh, more than twenty eight thousand eight hundred members. And this just shows that um, you know how much we all appreciate sharing knowledge. And uh, that is for the benefit of our patients, because in the end, whatever we learn, and uh, that is translated into better patient care, safer patient care. And as is the uh, motto of this group, uh, safe anesthesia means safe surgery. And if you have a safe anesthesia and safe surgery, you actually have a safe patient. So the faculty uh, for plans today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Sujitranika, uh, we have uh, Kalaiswaran, we have Dilip Singh Pramar, Preeti, uh, we have uh, Tushar, Ganesh, Dr. Dilip Rana, Minal Chaudhary, um, and Darya Pandit as well. So a, a very experienced uh, faculty group uh, who are going to take us through uh, some of the landmark uh, techniques, uh, which are very useful for providing anesthesia as well as analgesia for patients. Uh, so this is the list of the um, topics we are going to start off with. So I'm going to start off with basics of loss of resistance blocks. And the most important thing uh, for uh, the you know, the blocks is, is knowing, uh, you know, you need a needle. You obviously got a syringe full of anesthetic, but uh, what kind of a needle uh, do we uh, use? Uh, you can use just a simple hypodermic needle. Uh, there are uh, commercially available uh, needles called plexifix needles. We can use epidural needles. They're blunt drawing up needles. You can also use uh, the pencil point or bullet point spinal needle, or even the quinky needle, which has been blunted. And there are uh, uh, the tab block needles are available as well. So if you look at hypodermic needle, hypodermic needles are very sharp. They're meant for cutting so that uh, they go through the tissues very easily. Uh, or patient may not, if they're you know, being used for injections, I'm injections, patient do not feel that much pain. They should uh, not cause much trauma. Uh, but if you use for nerve blocks, these can cut through nerves, so they're not very good. Plus, you won't feel the resistance going through the fascia. So we need to blunt this needle. So we need to make a sharp needle into a sort of short bevel needle or a blunted needle. You can do this by uh, you know, taking an ampule, a sterile ampule, and then uh, rubbing it, uh, the uh, sharp tip inside a sterile ampule. Or even uh, you know using a sterile ball, a steel ball um, to blunt it, or even the cap of the needle can be used. So there are different ways of blunting uh, the needle. There are blunt uh, tip needles which are available. Uh, these are really, really blunt. Do they do cause a lot of trauma? You may feel the pop very easily, but they do actually cause a lot of trauma to the tissue. Uh, this is a plexiferous needle. The advantage is that it comes with an extension uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, on the top, uh, that is the tip of the uh, hypodermic needle, whereas uh, that is the tip of the uh, your plexifix needle, which is a short bevel. So you tend to feel a better pop through fascia when you have a short bevel uh, needle. Like I said, you can actually use a uh, pencil point needle as well, or uh, bullet point uh, spinal needles or even epidural needles uh, with a two heat point. The commonest thing used uh, by most people, which is actually pretty cheap because epidural needles or plexifix needle or a spine needle, they're costly. Uh, you can actually use that. So you can uh, do that um, using a inside of a ampule. Uh, this is just scratching uh, through, through it, okay. 
and making it bent, or you can actually use a, a bigger needle to do that. So here I'm showing a close up. So you place the uh, tip of the uh, hypodermic needle through a large blunt needle, and you can then blunt it accordingly. So it becomes like a parrot beak. This is called a, a parrot beaking. You can actually see very clearly uh, how the tip of the needle has been bent. So this is, can be done in a very controlled manner. So you can see how the tip is exactly bent. So this is called parrot beaking of the uh, needle. And this is my own actually finger on my money hand. And you can see how much of indentation uh, this slight, uh, you know, parrot beaking actually causes without going through the skin. So it's not piercing. If it was a hypodermic needle with that kind of pressure, uh, it would have gone through my skin cause bleeding. So one of the disadvantages of uh, using a blunt needle is uh, something called a cushion effect. Uh, this I uh, had actually described in uh, an article somewhere in 2011. So this is what it is. So you got, uh, you know, the skin and the layer of fat, the subcutaneous fat. When you use a blunt needle, uh, there is indentation of the skin, it get approximated. And when you go through the skin, you could have, pierce through the first layer of the fascia. And when you feel for the so-called second pop, that might be actually be through the third layer. And you end up depositing local anesthetic in the wrong place. So it's very, very important uh, to actually understand this. You can actually see that how that indentation is happening. And then see, look at the pressure required to go uh, through the skin. So this is called a cushion effect. So it's important how you manage this uh, cushion effect uh, one thing is that if you're using a uh, you know, hypodermic needle, which has been blunted, uh, especially if it's parrot beaking, that you enter uh, the skin at an acute angle uh, so that uh, the sharp bit goes through the skin easily. And then you uh, increase the angle to almost 90 degrees to the skin. So you can feel uh, the pops through the fascia very easily. The other technique is needle through needle technique. This is useful. So you actually have, say for example, done a small anesthesia and now you want to give a block as well uh, for increasing uh, the duration of analgesia. here. So you can use the same uh, needle and uh, you know uh, the introducer can be, uh, so it goes through the skin and through that you can place your uh, blunt needle or the pencil point needle uh, so that you have gone or you have actually avoided uh, the cushion effect. The other technique is called pinching the fat or PDF technique. In this, you, this is very useful for uh, patients, obese patients. So you uh, pinch the skin between your thumb and uh, your index finger with one hand, and then go through this uh, fat, the skin and fat. So when you release the fat, the, the needle tip is, uh, almost straight away through the first on the muscle and then you can actually feel the pops very easily. So before uh, we start off uh, with today, some basic rules. Before you perform any block, it's very important that you go uh, take consent with the patient. Uh, when you go and meet the patient, you take full anesthetic history just because you're giving a block doesn't mean that you shouldn't know about the patient. Uh, you uh, also explain the procedure, what are you going to do, the risk involved, and you document it. Uh, you can uh, gain a written consent, but verbal consent is fine, but you need to mention that on your anesthetic chart uh, that verbal consent has been obtained. Uh, you can also discuss with the surgeon. So if you're not sure uh, what is the incision going to be, what muscles they're going to go through, or what bones they're going to cut through, you can discuss with the surgeon and then you decide on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is the most appropriate block for that patient. Also confirm the site. Uh, so normally the surgeons will actually place the arrow on the side, but always confirm this at the time of the, uh, your consent process, as well as when the patient comes to the theater, uh, confirm which side the patient is having the surgery. So once the patient has agreed and he's in the theater, uh, you will establish minimum standard monitoring. Uh, there need to be a fast flowing drip. Uh, you should be aware where your research equipment or drugs are. 
you need to have skill assistant. Um, obviously, you'll be prepared with equipment and drugs. You again check the correct position on site. Okay, wrong blocks have been done. So this is called the stop before you block moment. Okay, look for the arrow. Okay, and confirm with the patient. And obviously you will all take aseptic precautions. And don't forget to utilize multimodal analgesia intraoperatively and make sure that appropriate uh, analgesia is prescribed for the post-op period. To perform a proper block or adequate block uh, for a surgery, you need to know your anatomy. So I'm not talking about just the anatomy of the plexus or the nerves, but also the surgical anatomy. And that's why actually I said, you need to discuss with the surgeon, know the surgery, okay? No, you don't have to know in very much details, but at least know what, uh, where is the incision going to be? What muscles is going to cut through? Uh, you know, if it is doing orthopedic surgery, what bones are fixing, and know uh, which nerves supply this area. You need to know your drug. You need to actually calculate your maximum dose for local anesthetic, uh, especially for the facial uh, plane block where you, these are volume blocks. So you need to use appropriate dose, appropriate concentration, appropriate volume. You need to have interlipid in case of, uh, you know, the patient developing local anesthetic system toxicity. So know where your interlipid uh, is kept and, uh, you know, know the, uh, the doses and the protocols. The other important thing is that um, you need to give time for block to work. Uh, this is called the uh, core and uh, mental. It's not care, it's core. I think that's a spelling mistake there. Uh, so the, uh, the core bundles tend to supply the distal most area. So if you're actually giving a proximal block for a distal surgery, you need to actually give at least 30 to 40 minutes for the local anesthetic to soak the nerves. Okay, so give time for Giving a proximal block for proximal surgery, uh, you can actually 10, 15 minutes, a patient is almost ready for you. So if you're giving interscaling for shoulder surgery, amazing, you know, uh, the onset is actually very, very quick. Then other thing is that uh, sparing occurs. It is not a failure of block. It's quite possible there are anatomical variations in patients. Sometimes you might actually miss out this, you didn't discuss with the surgeon and he's extended uh, the incision beyond, uh, you know, the block area. So what? You can always ask the surgeon to do local infiltration, but if you come to know before the surgery start, you can always, uh, you know, uh, give a rescue block. So for some areas you can actually do rescue blocks. So never actually think uh, that uh, your block has failed. It's not, always the uh, thing that blocks rarely fail. They may be inadequate, but they actually have not failed. They have been uh, insufficient, okay. So with this, we will actually start. So we'll go from head to toe. And uh, so we'll start with head and neck. And uh, the first block uh, will be about a scalp block by color, uh, followed by the neck block, uh, the cervical plexus block by uh, the area. And uh, then we'll from the uh, head and neck, we'll move to the chest, also upper limb, the chest, the perineum, and then the lower limb. And uh, last one, uh, like I said, head to toe, will cover most of the blocks. Okay. So as like I said, the first one is a scalp uh, block by Kala. Uh, Kala is a freelancer anesthetist from Mumbai. Uh, she has a uh, special interest in, uh, you know, teaching uh, difficult airway. Uh, she's uh, very good at nerve blocks. And in private practice, uh, she actually covers most things uh, from uh, orthopedics to obstetrics, uh, gynecology, cancer surgery. So uh, she does a fair bit of uh, work in that. Uh, coming to the uh, anatomy of the scalp itself, uh, it can be divided uh, the area, uh, you know, uh, in front of the ear and behind the ear. In front of the ear, uh, there are two nerves which come from the trigeminal. So you got supratrochlear uh, and uh, supraorbital coming from ophthalmic division. Then you have zagreb 
uh, zygotoma zygomatico temporal, uh, which is a branch of the maxillary auricle uh, temporal, which is a division of the mandibular. So you can see that uh, it is from all three divisions of the trigeminal it gives. But behind the uh, your ear, uh, we have the greater auricular, uh, lesser occipital, greater occipital, and third occipital nerves. And I'll show you this in drag diagrammatically. So here you can see in front of the ear, you got the supratrochlear, uh, supraorbital coming from ophthalmic, zygomaticotemporal uh, coming from the maxillary, auriculotemporal coming from the mandibular. Then uh, you got the greater auricular uh, nerve C to C3, which is part of the cervical plexus. Uh, you got the lesser hospital coming from the uh, cervical plexus, whereas greater hospital and third hospital, they arise uh, directly from C2 and C3 nerves. This is back of the head. When you're on the back of the head, be careful uh, with the hospital artery uh, when you're infiltrating, especially uh, for the greater hospital uh, nerve. Uh, this is just showing that uh, the front of the uh, you know, the face the, is mainly uh, by the uh, divisions of the uh, your trigeminal nerve. And you can see the uh, lesser hospital and uh, the greater auricular coming from the uh, cervical uh, plexus. Also important to know is the uh, dangerous area of the scalp. And this is actually uh, the uh, loose areolar uh, tissue, uh, which is uh, uh, lying uh, you know, in the area where the blood vessels and connective tissues are. So if you develop a, a bleeding there, a clot there, which get infected, it can actually, you know, uh, uh, you know spread in this area very, very easily. And uh, you need to also remember where the nerves are, where the blood vessels are. So um, that is again, uh, important to know where you're going to inject your local anesthetic. Uh, so, Kala, are you actually ready uh, for your video? Kala? Yes. Okay, over to you then. I'm actually filling for the supraorbital notch and marking for supratrochlear and supraorbital. Both lie very close to each other. The medial side of your uh, eyebrow. This is the zygomatico temporal. This is auricular temporal in front of the ear, around one to one point five centimeters above near the tragus. Now, for coming to the occipital nerves, you draw a line from the mastoid process to the occipital protuberance, divide the line into three parts. The junction between the, and also, so you have to go for the greater auricular, that is the, at the superficial cervical plexus level. Okay, so now with the landmarks, the needle point, uh, ins needle of insertion mark, now I'll go for the, the supratrochlear and the supraorbital at one injection. You can cover both the nerves. I'm using 3 ml of a mixture of 0.75% uh, ropivacaine and 2% adrenaline xylocaine. You can see just three, 2 to 3 ml of the LA mixture solution at each level. This is a zygomatico temporal. Coming to the auricular temporal nerve, just in front of your ear pinna, 1 to 1.5 centimeters medially. Again, 2 to 3 ml of the LA mixture. I'm feeling for the mastoid and the occipital protuberance. There's a line drawn, and it's divided into two three parts. The medial one-third and the lateral two-third junction is for the greater occipital. Here you can palpate the greater occipital artery and inject medially to it. Okay. 
This is the lesser occipital nerve lying at the junction between the lateral one third and the medial two third. And the great auricular nerve is covered in the superficial cervical plexus block at the level of the neck, that is the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid at its midpoint. And the infiltration more towards your head end, head side. For scalp block, you have to remember six injections and seven nerves. Okay. This will cover the entire ipsilateral side. When you have crossover fibers, this is a basal cell carcinoma excision and a flap to be raised. So there are the crossover fibers from the opposite side. So I'll give the contralateral side, supratrochlear and the supraorbital nerve block also. And I am checking for the efficacy of my block with a pin prick. And the patient was under mild sedation. He could answer me very nicely. In the surgery, excision of the basal cell carcinoma lesion. Done very nicely under sedation and scalp block. This is the flap that was raised. Patient could go home the next day and NBM out of NBM within four hours. And skull block is extremely simple and easy to perform. I use it as a sole block with sedation and also give it along with GA for every craniotomy. Thank you. Any questions? I, I don't think any questions have come up on the uh, uh, group yet, uh, Kala. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Bart, um, what are the other, so this was um, more for a, uh, you know, lesion on the scalp uh, for a flap. Yeah. And it was a melanoma excision as well. So. Uh, yeah. Are there any other... Uh... Sir, for every GA, uh, even after giving GA, you can use it for craniotomies. It blunts the hemodynamic response while mm -hmm. drilling yeah. in the uh, skull. It reduces the intraoperative anesthesia requirement, the opioid requirements. It gives excellent postoperative pain relief. And uh, even for awake craniotomies, where you need to map the extent of the tumor, especially in the motor area, you can allow the patient to guide you, to uh, guide the surgeon to uh, for the level of excision, you know, so that he doesn't damage the uh, important structures. What about things like, you know, for burr hole surgeries? Isn't yeah, burr hole and all easily can yeah, be done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Answer, yeah. I think there is actually a whole spectrum of uh, awake neurosurgeries, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Epilepsy surgery. And if the patient's GC is poor, I mean, you need to intubate. You have to take care because they are going to be under the drapes. Yeah. So you need to monitor very well. You have to monitor the carbon dioxide, I mean, ETCO2 also. No? Mm. And the, you know, in, in between, you have to talk to the patient or you have to drape it in such a way the patient doesn't feel claustrophobic inside. Yeah, so you have to take care of, obviously, uh, if you're doing uh, any neurosurgery, I think uh, uh, oxygenation, maintaining mean arterial pressure, uh, maintaining entire CO2, these are actually three uh, very yes. important things. Obviously, uh, that also includes the- And, the and also the patient shouldn't move, sir. The surgeon yeah. needs a-, a uh, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, so uh, from uh, this, we will move on to from uh, the head and scalp, we move on to Could the I neck. I have a question? If yes, I uh, Minal, yeah. Yeah, uh, ma'am, could you please tell how do you palpate for the supratrochlear and the supraorbital ridge? Like, I just wanted to know where- Yeah, you have, have to go along the supraorbital ridge and towards the 
medial side of your eyebrow you will get a notch through which the supra orbital nerve comes out no yes so that is the point for your supra orbital nerve so at that instant you inject for your supra orbital nerve and medially your same injection can be continued for your supra trochlear so around a 1 to 1.5 cm radius you raise a wheel which will cover both and ma'am are you going how deep like is, is it like uh, uh, there is one question from the audience yeah how deep do you how deep means you how, hit the bone deep? 2 mm okay uh, there is one question from the audience uh, what are the landmarks hello yeah, can you can you hear me hello hello can you hear me yep gone gone uh, sujitra yeah there is one question from the audience uh, uh, what are the landmarks for greater and lesser occipital nerve to block yeah the uh, greater and lesser occipital nerve you have to draw feel for the occipital protuberance first stain the patient's head on one side feel for the occipital protuberance and the mastoid process draw a straight line divide it into three parts okay so the junction between the medial means from the occipital protuberance uh, uh, one third and two thirds towards the orbit now that is your greater occipital nerve and the junction of one one third and two third from the orbit now that is your lesser occipital okay and also you can feel uh, palpate the greater occipital artery medial to the greater occipital artery is your greater occipital nerve greater occipital artery okay. may not be palpable uh, in you not be palpable yes a, but you have to aspirate yeah. always yeah. you have to aspirate you divide in thank you three parts and the junctions between the one third two third two third one third okay yeah i think that that covers covers that very well uh, kala i think um, yes sir yeah very well i think explained and um, so moving on to uh, cervical plexus anatomy and blocks uh, this will be by deria pandit uh, deria is a freelancing anesthetist in surat in gujarat and uh, his area of interest is regional anesthesia he does uh, pns and ultrasound guided blocks and he loves doing uh, high risk cases under regional anesthesia technique so if you look at the uh, you know the cervical plexus is called the plexus of the loops so c1 c2 actually uh, is uh, one loop c2 c3 second loop c3 c4 third loop and from this arises the superficial nerve lesser occipital nerve uh, from c2 uh, greater auricular which kala just mentioned from c2 c3 and then you have the anterior cutaneous nerve uh, which is uh, the c2 c3 and supraclavicular nerves uh, which is the c3 c4 uh supraclavicular nerves uh, supplies the nape of the shoulder so it's important for shoulder surgery and it also supplies the clavicle so for the clavicular surgery this is important so you have two ascending branches lesser occipital greater auricular the ascending uh, one transverse branches which is anterior cutaneous nerve and the descending branch are the supraclavicular nerves so the deeper branches uh, basically are the muscular branches and uh, they do actually communicate uh, with the hypoglossal nerve and uh, with the uh, your accessory spinal nerve and these supply the strap muscles and the stenocleidomastoid, mastoid the trapezius and uh, the levator scapulae sclerosis medius and also there is also communication uh, with the phrenic nerve so c3 c4 c5 uh, forms a phrenic nerve as uh, so which you have to be careful with that So when we talk about superficial uh, plexus block, we are basically blocking the the superficial uh, branches, that is the ascending branches, which are like I said, the lesser occipital and the greater auricular, and the transverse cervical branches or the anterior cutaneous branches, and then you also block these uh, supraclavicular nerve, which are the descending branches. Now these uh, all these three nerves meet at a point which is at the midpoint of the posterior border of stenocleidomastoid. mastoid. and this is called the nerve point of the neck and uh, this is just another diagram showing the various uh, communications and the uh, you know deeper branches which supply the muscles 
you have to also see that the, these nerves are lying in a compartment, uh, which is highly vascular. And you have to be very careful about uh, injection into artery, especially the vertebral artery lies very close by when you're going uh, closer to the uh, transverse process of the cervical uh, vertebrae. So the uh, point, uh, the landmark uh, for superficial and intermediate plexus block is the midpoint of the posterior sternocleidomastoid. Uh, and this is the nerve point, like I've said. And the superficial cervical plexus is easy to remember that you actually have branches going up. So the ascending branches descend, you have descending branches and we got the anterior branches and local anesthetic inferior posterior border form that. Now the intermediate uh, plexus block, this is something which people tend to confuse with. Some people also call this as the uh, uh, you know, superficial cervical plexus block. And I need to actually explain this in slightly more details. Now here is the uh, in a diagram of the, um, your superficial branches. And you can actually see uh, at the midpoint of the posterior border stenocleidomastoid, mastoid, you can uh, see the ascending branches and the transverse uh, uh, branches or the anterocutaneous branches, uh, which have already pierced the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. But the intermediate, uh, sorry, the uh, supraclavicular nerves, uh, they are still lying below the investing uh, fascia. They only come out uh, much uh, lower down. So if you do not actually go, uh, you know, all along the uh, posterior border, uh, you may actually miss out on the supraclavicular uh, branches. So when you actually pierce uh, the investing fascia of the neck, so that is the supraclavicular space, for example, and you can actually see the investing fascia of the deep neck and the supraclavicular nerves coming through it and piercing uh, the fascia uh, above the clavicle. So for the intermediate plexus block, uh, you need to pierce the investing fascia, uh, which actually invests all over the neck. Uh, you need to pierce that fascia uh, to do the investing. So uh, superficial uh, block is actually outside uh, the uh, investing fascia, sorry, investing fascia of the neck. The intermediate plexus block, uh, once you pierce the investing fascia of the neck, uh, that is the uh, intermediate uh, plexus block. And when you actually go near the transverse process, inject the local anesthetic uh, near the root, uh, that is the uh, deep uh, cervical plexus uh, block. Heria, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sir. Okay, so I'm going to actually go through your video. You can actually start uh, explaining okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here, as you can see, uh, posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and the midpoint between the clavicular head and the mustard head, I have identified it. Uh, and here, just I am entering into the skin. As okay. I enter, the, yeah, please, sir. Yeah. As I enter the skin, just beneath the skin, I am infiltrating here to give my superficial plexus block. Uh, here, for superficial plexus, I am giving a T222 ml in each direction. As you can see, I have given a, now I am giving a quarterly 2 ml from the same point of entry. And again, for the 2 ml in the cranially. Now, as you can see, for the intermediate plexus block, I am just entering, piercing the investing fascia. And you can see the pop-up fill, and I just enter in the intermediate cervical space, I am just injecting the drug of 6 ml there. Uh, the same way here, my surgery is for the hemithyroidectomy, and for that purpose, I have given a 6 ml superficial cervical plexus as well as 6 ml of 0.25 percent BP vacuum in the intermediate cervical plexus block. Here, I have given this block for the purpose of the analgesia, post of analgesia, and perioperative patient is uh, already intubated. So, in that way, we can control the, we can give the superficial cervical plexus, intermediate cervical plexus black. Deep cervical plexus is not used nowadays much because intermediate cervical plexus, the drugs is by itself so spread there. And uh, so we can, with both the two blocks, we can utilize. If there's total thyroidotomy, I will give a bilateral block. Yeah. Um, so, um, 
coming coming to the uh, block, you did actually uh, give uh, the intermediate like I had I already explained. Uh, yeah. It's just at the midpoint. So uh, the whole idea of the block is that you need to be at the posterior border of stenocritic mastoid and uh, at the uh, midpoint. That is the uh, no yeah. point for cervical uh, plexus. I think you explained very well that this can be used for a lot of surgeries on the neck. You need to be very careful uh, with bilateral blocks. Yes, yes, absolutely, sir. Yeah, I've actually explained that you actually have communication with the phrenic nerve, uh, yeah, C3, yes. C4, C5. Uh, you don't want to be blocking that. Um, the superficial blocks, bilateral, are pretty safe. Um, but once you actually go bilateral intermediate plexus block, and mm -hmm. uh, then there are chances of blocking the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve. Yeah. It can spread. This can spread to the, uh, you know, the uh, phrenic nerve and uh, cause cause the uh, block. So if you have to give bilateral block, either give bilateral superficial. But if, for example, you actually have a, a deeper surgery on one side and other side is just minor, in that case, you can actually give yeah, yeah, yeah. a block on one side. And other side, you can get superficial. Super so, yeah. Uh, deep blocks, both sides are basically uh, no no. No. Um, uh, so, with this uh, two um, uh, blocks, the scalp and the uh, cervical, we uh, actually finished the session for head and neck. Uh, the faculty, anybody wants to add anything uh, to the comments or any questions or any clarifications? Uh, there is actually a question from Tushara Vincent. He said, "Cat carotid uh, endoctomy may be done under uh, intermediate plexus block." Uh, Hundred percent. Yes, 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 it can be. Uh, well, there are I people doing uh, the block. Yeah. Sorry. Can I ask one question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Daria, can we do clavicle surgery under uh, superficial and inter intermediate cervicals? That is uh, one of the commonly asked questions. Uh, yeah. Can you do clavicle surgery? On yeah, yes, yes, madam. I am doing a clavicle surgery with a superficial cervical plexus block, but I like to add an interscalene block sometime if the my fracture clavicle fracture head is a later one third. Then uh, the same way superficial cervical blocks you have to go according to what the incision site. If my shoulder surgery clavicle surgery is there, then my more concentration is that I am injecting the more cordially. Same way if uh, the cervi uh, cervical lymph node is there. And then my more concern is that I will go just uh, perpendicular and more uh, cranial. As uh, Kalamadam told, for the uh, craniotomy or something like that, I have to give a superficial cervical more cranially. So in that way, uh, for the like sole purpose of this block, uh, thyroid surgery, parathyroidectomy, no, with no, one side I, I just want for the clavicle. Clavicle, yeah, 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 yeah. Clavicle I done with a ad added brittle plexus block, depending on the site of the clavicle fracture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me actually add to that clavicular fracture. Uh, I had like I was explaining during the anatomy, the clavicle is supplied by the supraclavicular nerves, mm. right? So that is actually the mainly the body of the clavicle. But if you are actually going to go to the sternoclavicular junction or the acromioclavicular junction, then you need to actually add intermediate cervical okay. block. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, interscalene. Interscalene block. block. So for, you don't actually have to go up, like you don't actually have to do the complete uh, superficial cervical plexus block. You need to actually do intermediate cervical plexus. Like I have explained, if you actually are outside the investing fascia of the neck, you are not going to block the supraclavicular nerves. You need to infiltrate the supraclavicular nerve at the uh, in a nerve point at the midpoint of the clavic of the sternocleidomastoid is still lying below the investing fascia. They come out above the clavicle, okay, uh, to lie outside the investing fascia. So if you want to actually uh, give a good block, then uh, do an intermediate plexus block uh, for the clavicle. And yes. If the plating is going to go on to the, uh, you know, towards the acromioclavicular uh, joint, uh, then interscaling block actually adds to that. So you can do the whole surgery on the front. Any other questions? Uh, sir, if we are doing just a lymph nodal detection, uh, yeah. I often do it under this block only, but I want to know then 
in that situation we'll be using 0.5% not 0.25% because we are not yeah. going to be giving any other uh, yeah. any like it's just sedation and then 0.5% so of 0.5% yeah yeah so 10 to 12 ml is sufficient right? yes, yes absolutely you don't need a huge volume for uh, uh, blocking see the advantage of using 0.5% is the onset right the two things with higher concentration you give uh, get a dense block and you get a quicker onset you can use 0.25 for soft tissue surgeries uh, but you need to give time so if you have enough time you can use use 0.25 as well but here the volume is not the dose is not a concern uh, you're doing for that so yes yeah you can use 0.5% very safely you're using less volume uh, but like i said don't use the whole uh, amount so if you're looking at 50 uh, kg person uh, the limit is 2 ml per kg 100 mg uh, you don't want to use the whole thing because you need to actually leave some amount of local anesthetic for a uh, surgeon to infiltrate if there is any sparing so always keep that in mind never never try to exceed the huge the whole amount thank you Okay, so we move on to the next uh, section. Uh, so we come on to the upper limb. Uh, in this section, we will be discussing uh, two uh, important blocks, which everybody uh, should know: supraclavicular, which will be by Dr. Dilip Rana, and axillary uh, by uh, Dr. Suchitra. Uh, so supraclavicular block is considered as the spinal of the upper limb, and um, axillary again is uh, like a bread and butter block for most people uh, for surgeries uh, at the elbow and below um, and they can always be combined if there is anything you can always uh, do blocks uh, you know spare sparing blocks at the individual nerves uh, so we'll be talking about brachial plexus anatomy everybody knows this it's uh, Uh, becomes a bit boring, uh, but we all know. I like to actually explain this as a tree. So the tree has roots, then it has trunks, and then it has branches. So it is like a tree. So the roots C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. Uh, C5, C6 then combine to form the upper trunk. C7 continues on its own. C8, T1 combines the lower trunk. then all of them divides into ventral branches and dorsal branches dorsal branches all combine together uh, to form the posterior cord and the uh, uh, ventral branches of the upper and middle form the uh, uh, lateral cord and that of the uh, you know coming uh, then you have the uh, medial cord so uh, there are a lot of other nerves as well we only talk about the main nerves the muscular uh, muscular cutaneous uh, the axillary radial median and ulnar nerves and uh, there are other nerves like the supra scapular nerve which comes out uh, from the uh, superior trunk uh, there are the pectoral nerves the medial and lateral pectoral nerves which are important for uh, breast surgery uh, which are coming from the cord level thank you but we tend to actually like concentrate mainly on the main main branches so when we are actually talking about uh, the uh, you know uh, our blocks the supraclavicular and the uh, you know our axillary uh, we are uh, going to talk about divisions for supraclavicular and the main branches uh, for the axillary uh, block and uh, the nerves are lying in relation to the artery in this case uh, we are going to talk about the subclavian artery and uh, how the nerves are lying uh, around it uh, how it's important to feel the all the divisions uh, on ultrasound we call them they look like bunch of grapes they're lying uh, just posterior to the artery that's where uh, the supraclavicular block is done Uh, whereas the in the axillary uh, we go uh, into the axilla and uh, they are lying around it uh, in relation to the artery uh, this is a dissection a very popular dissection you can actually see uh, that the phrenic nerve lies on to the uh, sclenus anterior uh, that pn is the uh, phrenic nerve uh, vertebral artery is the va and you can actually see uh, the uh, you know main uh, the trunks C5 root up there, C8 root below, 
uh, in the interscaling, we tend to miss out the CAT1, and that's why the ulnar sparing occurs uh, with the uh, interscaling. Uh, whereas the uh, when you block the divisions uh, near the uh, clavicle, sorry, the first rib, that is supraclavicular, it gives a very, very dense block. So supraclavicular block will be discussed by Dr. Dilip uh, Rana. And Dr. Dilip Rana will be explaining as the classical approach, uh, where you need to go at the midpoint of a clavicle just above it. There is another technique which is also very much talked about. It's called the plumb bob technique, where you come in absolutely perpendicular uh, and hit the, uh, you know, the plexus or the rib and just walk off it to that. So, but I think it's very, very important to understand the classical approach which uh, Dr. Dilip Rana uh, will be uh, discussing. So Dr. Dilip is a freelancer uh, from Mumbai. Uh, he's not only a, a, a you know, a well-established anesthesiologist, but he's also got a law degree, though he doesn't practice law, but he's also got a law degree as well. Uh, he's got special interest in anesthesia for general surgery, for ENT, orthopedics, uh, obstetrics, and uh, he loves regional anesthesia. And like I said, his interest is also in, in law as well, even though he does not practice. Uh, Dr. Dilip, are you there? Yes, yes, very much. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'm going to go over to your video. Please. You can uh, keep telling us what you're doing. Patient 36 year old on anti-conversion for implant removal and the surgeon thought of block. Hmm. The patient was taken up in the OT. Regular monitoring was done, IV established and the site was prepared. Though this block requires interscaline, but I usually do it with the supraclavicular quite some time. I will be adding an interscaline block as a supplement to it also. Here I take equal amount of crystal water, xylophene with adrenaline, and sensor can 0.5%. And uh, you should three times that is sufficient for most of the blocks. The direction patient with the head turn on the opposite side. Try to palpate the subclean artery. That's the landmark based. Subclean artery. Confirmation will be by disappearance of the brachial plex. Uh, when you press the artery, the pulse oximetry waveform disappears on the monitor. Or you ask an assistant to check the pulse on the same side. If he declares that pulse is missing, I'm sure of the brachial artery, subclean artery. The needle I take usually is 24 gauge hypodermic. Direction downward, backward, ipsilateral toe or ipsilateral nipple I start with. Then every injection that I inject from subcute to the first rib, I deviate with 10 degrees laterally towards axilla. Three injection does it. This is the way I try to avoid most of the complications, keeping away from the phrenic, keeping away from the pleura, and that's it. Patient was a bit anxious, so blood pressure was high. But later on, after the block is settled down, here you can see the pressure on the artery showing oximetry pulse waveform disappearing. Direction is more important. Downward, backward towards the toe or ipsilateral nipple. Sometimes I get arterial puncture, but then I proceed and rest my needle on the rib, inject there, so that artery pushes up. I come out 
and then direct the needle laterally. Once you have picked the artery, you have nothing to worry. Laterally, there is nothing else now. You are safe. Here, repeated aspiration also is not needed because I already taken the RP earlier. Thereafter, I try to limit the spread of local anesthetics to unwanted spaces by pressing the palpating fingers. And sometimes I do massage outwardly so that uh, it doesn't spread centrally. This is the second filling of the local anesthetics. Equal volume of xylocaine with adrenaline, sensor cane and disorder. Am I audible? Yep. Subclavian artery localization is the primary important step in supraclavicular brachial plexus block. Once you have noticed that position and a direction that is kept outside, you are safe. It works very well. Before nerve stimulator, I was for years together, I was doing the same thing under landmark place. All my years, I have been practicing this block. Recently, only two years, I started with PNS. Yeah. Then I'll be supplementing it with the interscaline. Same point, brachial plexus artery, an inch above. Direction downward, backward, bit lateral, but superficial, much superficial, just one centimeter depth, good enough. An infiltrative field block is what required. See this massaging so that the spread doesn't go centrally. I take it downwards, outwards. Any questions? The patient was not much sedated, he was away. And Surgery and lasted for one and a half hours because one screw was missing in uh, direct visualization. I visited the patient post op 24 hours up afterwards and he had milk complaints. Yeah, so uh, I think um, there's uh, one question that says, how much total volume? Uh, three times uh, I take. 10, sorry? 10 cc. So total volume is only six, six cc to nine cc of xylocaine, six cc to nine cc of bupiocaine. Yeah. 
have you actually tried doing it uh, with uh, alone just... no because it's uh, it's out of reflex it comes up <laughs> for years together this was a training so even if i try to but i have failed it <laughs> just do try uh, once with uh, uh, plain book you again we can you see that the onset time is not much different and the analysis sometime i add dexamethasone yeah it gives yeah. a little okay. prolongation it does it does okay uh, so before we uh, go move on to the next uh, session not session but the next block accelerated block any questions or anybody wants to and anything uh, from the faculty side yeah sir i want to ask you that uh, in the you said that i've never done a blind block for supra class you know? so in the video if you were going the direction which you were taking for fear and uh, cordal but you were going really deep like 2 to 3 cm like the entire needle was going in so i just want yeah. to know that uh, are we supposed to give it that deep because normally within 1 cm 1.5 cm we have the plexus So you're going really deep and then depositing. Sometimes you're coming out. Sometimes you're going deep. I'm a little confused. Anybody wants to answer, please. I have artery punctured first insertion only. Thereafter, I go whatever depth. I'm safe. Only thing, a repeated trauma to the now. That is what is expected. People say, but I have not yet found out. My patients never complained. And uh, safety, you can see. at the depth of three fourth of that needle i rest my needle on the first tree that was the depth i got sometime i get up to 5 to 6 cm also so that time when i can't reach i take spinal needle but direction you keep it outward then you are safe if the with fear because this is the only way i took my fear out hmm brachial plexus somebody says it is not palpated that means i am compressing it go lateral thereafter you are safe so i think uh, what is happening in this case is you are actually going along the plexus along the plexus in the direction yeah. of the trunk going into yeah. divisions on the axilla yeah exactly so that's why you are deep so and that was the uh, question which minal had posed and that's what her worry was that right. in most cases you tend to actually hit the rib uh, very superficially within 1.5 to yeah, 2 yeah then you have to remain superficial yeah yeah i think uh, in that in that situation so there are very many that's why people need to actually understand there are quite a few approaches to supraclavicular block when you actually whether you using plumb up technique or using the classical technique uh, where you hit the rib and you walk off the rib and uh, you need to walk away from the artery okay don't if you're hitting yeah. the artery you did that, that you are too medial yeah but that plumbum yeah. they say the approach is superior and laterally you go vertically down downwards yeah here yeah. in the mistake is if there is a fat patient you may go medially and hit the pleura yeah once yeah. you are on the downward side and then you keep lateral to the artery you are safe yeah that is the only thing so if you actually read the book uh, especially the david brown can i ask one question yeah yep Good welcome sir can i ask a question yeah go on uh, every time are you feeling for the artery uh, when you did multiple injections the yeah. needle was removed and again and uh, second time again you went there so are you able to feel the artery every time once you have say sometime you put a small marker there subcutaneous implantation uh-huh. half cc or once you have put the finger there and depth your nail or finger marks always are there and your hand automatically goes to the artery don't have to palpate you are out of that because uh, with even 5 ml of uh, the la in under uh, usg you can see the artery being pushed to one side so the artery after injection of some la the it never remains in the same so place so it will be medial only to that point it will not come lateral i'm safe 
Yeah. Sir, what are the chances of pleura puncture in this technique? I already said I am on the lateral side of the artery and I go all the way laterally. There is no pleura. Medial part of the rib, if you go near, then the pleura comes in the picture. Once you are on the artery, I have taken the artery today in this picture. And then I stay 10 degrees deviation from the main point of insertion towards the toe and go towards the axilla. My needle is going away. And the first trip and the second trip becomes steps one and two where I cannot puncture the pleura because I am going down and laterally. Yeah. So the the uh, answer to that is that pleura lies medially, not laterally. Yeah. Even in patients uh, who are COPD with a cupola is raised. Uh, it, the phrenic also goes yeah. away medially. Yeah, it's medial. It's absolutely. The phrenic nerve is medial. And uh, I have no major, except supraclavicular artery and now they are sometimes they are low down on that supraclavicular fossa. I don't have major artery except now in this 30 degree of division from the first point to the third point. So you do actually saying that the, there are actually anatomical variations which you actually possible, see. Possible, possible. No, no, during, during the... Uh, uh, ultrasound, you will see that drosal scapular artery going between the plexus. So never, never actually think that just because you hit the artery subclavian once, you cannot hit the artery again. It may not be the subclavian; it can be dorsal scapular artery. Possible. I actually just last week, uh, while doing a uh, block, uh, my trainee was there, and the plexus was actually divided into two by the suprascapular artery. The suprascapular artery. Uh, going between the, uh, you know, divisions. So that can happen. So there are always, there are always, um, you know, a lot of anomalies, uh, which uh, people don't actually, uh, you know, recognize. My needle is 25 number, usually 24, 25 thick, thin needle. So always, so always aspirate, always aspirate. Yeah. And aspirate is always. Always, always aspirate and inject. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, during my residency, we did not have PNSs at that point in time. So we used to often practice the supraclavicular technique. Now, our technique was pretty um, barbaric. If you look at it today, we used to tell the patient, we'll go, we're going to poke you there and you're going to feel, you know, the tingling or the electric shock or whatever language you're using. So the patient had, we, we depended heavily on the patient's uh, response. Yeah, yeah, to be able to give a good block. And in case we were not able to do that, the last thing would be, you know, find the first rib and walk on the rib. And also now uh, to prevent misplacement of the needle, what we did at that point in time was we used to use the uh, pediatric vein flons that were available. So once the needle reached its point, we just took out the stillet and the, uh, this would be kept there, you know. The, the outer sheath would remain there. And that is how we walked upon the rib and uh, gave our uh, uh, necessary LA. Yes, people were actually leaving uh, the cannula in uh, with interscalene. Yes. Uh, leaving in for actually supplementing the blocks later. So that uh, technique is a, is a known technique of using the cannula and leaving it. Uh, probably safer because you are not going to actually then cause further damage with the uh, sharper uh, we used needles. to sit there with the dynaplast, you know, so that it doesn't yeah. move. Some yeah. weird sort of a contraption that we had. Though I, today when I look back, I find it a little scary, but yeah, yeah it did work for us way back then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Dilip, uh, do you always seek paresthesia? That was one of the questions asked uh, in the group. Yeah, paresthesia is not looked after. Yes. Usually, I have landmark based subclavian artery and three injections. First injection on the first tree itself gives enough anesthesia to the three trunks which are trying to pass by that first tree. So, more maybe I may not be getting the paresthesia. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Yes. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Welcome. Uh, what is the failure rate which you come across? With well, in private practice, failure rate is not accepted, sir. It has to work. Right. That is the reason field, infiltrative field block that I go. 
infiltrative field block in the region where I expect the trunks to be there, minimum failure rate, I can say. Yeah. So, um, well, what is your definition of failure, uh, Ganesh? Failure is basically uh, pain or incision or any time during the surgery, the patient complains of any kind of uh, sensation or pain that is perceived as a uh, inadequate block. Yeah. So then then how, do you, how do you manage that? How do you manage that? Yeah, so that's why I actually explained that uh, failure means the block did not work at all. But if you're actually... Incision uh, pain is non-fact. The first uh, incision patient will feel something, and that's no big deal until as the patient actually moves. Local infiltration. Mouth. Yeah, absolutely. You can give local infiltration if patient doesn't tolerate it. Some patients will perceive just the pressure as pain. They will, because that sensation cannot be taken away all the time. True. So True, I sir. don't think you should be actually termed as failure. Uh, the failure would be if the patient surgeon goes with a knife and the arm moves and hits the surgeon. That would be a failure. <laughs> yeah, so you always test. You always test your block. Okay, pull, push, pinch, pinch. Okay, always to be remembered uh, for testing the block. So unlike uh, where uh, the blocks are used uh, for analgesia, uh, where it does not matter much, but if you're using the blocks only for surgery, then you should also know how to test them. And we will actually demonstrate that in the, our next symposium, when we do the symposium on PNS, uh, we will actually demonstrate that because that's where you actually see the responses as well. So we will actually demonstrate that. So uh, moving on to the next uh, part, uh, which is the axillary approach. Uh, this is uh, by Dr. Suchitra. Uh, who is a consultant anesthetist, freelance practitioner in Pune. Uh, her area of interest is peripheral nerve blocks. And most of her area of expertise is in obstetric anesthesia, trauma, and old age anesthesia. Uh, she's a very experienced anesthesiologist. And uh, we will be discussing uh, the axillary blocks. So the area of interest now moves down uh, into the axilla. And like I have said, uh, this is uh, looking at the main branches of the uh, brachial plexus, which are located around the artery, uh, the uh, brachial artery. So uh, when you are uh, talking about the axillary uh, block, people talk about uh, you know uh, infraclavicular block, uh, subcorocoid block. These are nothing but uh, proximal axillary block. So when we talk about the classical axillary block, which is basically at the uh, base of the axilla, the axilla extends uh, into and opens into the suprascapular, supraclavicular uh, fossa. Okay, so it is actually uh, the, at the apex, you tend to do uh, the uh, proximal axillary block, that is a VIB or retrocapricular. Uh, the intermediate is the subcoracoid approach, and the distal or the classical is at the uh, base of the uh, axilla. And so we have this uh, main uh, nerves coming out uh, from the lateral cord, middle cord, and the posterior cord. Uh, this slide just uh, at the apex of the axilla. Uh, the lateral cord gives rise to the muscular cutaneous and the lateral portion of median nerve. The medial cord gives rise to the medial portion of median nerve and the ulnar nerve. And the posterior cord gives right to the radial and the axillary nerve. So these are the main nerves uh, we are actually going to block. And uh, uh, Suchitra will actually explain this uh, very nicely to you, uh, where the nerves lie in relation to the artery, uh, how there are, uh, again, there are a huge number of variations uh, in where uh, the nerves are in relation to the artery. So, um, you know, especially when you're doing a, a nerve stimulation technique or ultrasound guarded technique, you will find this nerves located at different positions. Um, the one, two, three, four is actually just uh, looking at the various positions on the right side of the uh, diagram. Uh, Suchitra, uh, are you there? And um, we are ready with your video. Yes, sir. 
Yes, uh, just before going to the video, can I yeah. uh, speak yeah. uh, just for a moment? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. First, uh, uh, hello everyone. First, I would like to thank uh, Shiv and all the patrons of uh, Global Anesthesia Society for giving us the opportunity to be the part of the symposium today. And uh, once again, on this auspicious day of our, the birthday of the group, and once again, happy birthday to all of us. And uh, just before going to this auxiliary block, uh, there are uh, quite variations in this landmark uh, guided technique, uh, out of which I opted for one, uh, which is shown in the video. But before that, just quickly, um, uh, there are three methods by which uh, we can do the uh, landmark guided auxiliary block. It can be single injection, it can be double injection, or it can be transarterial. Um, and uh, all the basic preparation is the same. The safety factors already, Shiv sir has uh, told you, uh, the basic monitors are to be applied. Uh, the counseling of the patient is very important. Here, uh, I would like to uh, go in uh, something, uh, Professor Dilip Prana, I don't agree with you. Uh, there is always role for failure in private practice also. In fact, I explained to my all the patients that your block, uh, the block might fail because there is a lot of anatomical variation. And uh, most of the times it is a, a sort of, we don't, uh, we are not giving the uh, under vision. So uh, there can be a failure, and, but our black plants are ready. So the acceptance level uh, by the patient increases due to that. So uh, I always uh, explain to uh, that to the patient. And uh, we are supposed to take all the uh, basic uh, monitoring facility, uh, uh, factors uh, into account. Uh, we are supposed to uh, apply the pulse oximeter, ECG, NIVP, the IV line running. We are supposed to ensure all the emergency drugs and the equipment for resuscitation is there and ready, uh, especially last uh, for last. Uh, we uh, have to ensure that intralipid is available. Uh, so we can start with the- Yeah, I was going to start the video now then. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So the position of the patient, as you can see in the video, it is supine uh, with the arm abducted at 90 degrees at the shoulder and the elbow flexed and resting nicely on either a pillow or a uh, cushion cover, uh, cushion, a pad of cushion. Uh, first, we palpate uh, we, the painting and dripping means taking con into consideration all the aseptic precautions is done. Then we palpate the axillary artery and mark it with a sterile pen. Uh, it's a sterile uh, pen I mark it. And uh, yeah, the marking is done, as you can see. Then again, I'm just palpating the artery. And in this particular method, I'm, I have modified it a bit a little. Uh, at first, I'm giving local anesthetic uh, to the skin, local infiltration with the local uh, 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 to the skin by a 26 gauge uh, uh, needle and half inch needle because the needle used for the uh, block is a uh, 21 gauge, which comes with the syringe. It has been blunted a little by the method shown by Dr. Shiv. Uh, uh, it has been blunted a little so that uh, there isn't much of a pain to the patient. And uh, we get a proper pop when we pierce the axillary sheath. Uh, I just feel the, I had just felt for the axillary artery and uh, through a single puncture, I just first went above the artery and injected half the local anesthetic volume over there. Then I came back up to the skin and I went down. Yeah, I'm injecting in small aliquots, you must have seen. I'm injecting in very small, slowly in small aliquots after neg uh, repeated negative aspiration test. This is very important at axillary block because axillary area is very richly vascular. So uh, accidental vascular punctures are very common in this area. So we have to ensure that while giving the block, if the patient is awake, I go on talking with the patient. My ear is on the monitor sound and I go on talking with the patient so that the earliest sign of last is not missed because patient immediately start uh, saying uh, something giddiness or some complaints. Also, accidental intra, uh, so, uh, if we I am near the nerve or if I am damaging the nerve or intraneural, that also uh, it is judged because patient gains, gets intense pain if we are in the in the nerve. That also we have to ensure that we are not in the nerve and we are not intravascular. And uh, after repeated aspiration, the local anesthetic volume uh, has been injected above and below the artery. And uh, the local anesthetic solution used uh, commonly is uh, ropivacaine, 0.5%. Uh, I take 30 cc of ropivacaine 
and uh, add 10 ml of normal saline to it. And in this particular surgery, it was a fracture lower end radius. Uh, it was a Kapanji uh, 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 procedure that is a percutaneous K wire fixation of the fracture. So not much of a um, uh, skin uh, uh, analgesia was needed. But uh, uh, so in short, we had to be a little, of course, I can understand that the spread inside is not in our hand, the spread of the local anesthetic solution. It can go anywhere once we inject. But uh, if at all, uh, if the surgery uh, it, uh, requires musculoskeletal nerve, then it's better to go uh, uh, in the superior compartment of the artery. It's better to go deep, deep, so that we are towards the coracoid process and take into consideration the musculoskeletal nerve. Because if, uh, if there is external fixator of the arm, forearm, then we need that particular nerve action. So it has to be a little varied. As Shivsar has already told, that we had uh, to vary our uh, method a little bit according to the surgery. We should ask the surgeon what exactly surgery is and vary uh, your method. And after the um, injection, give firm pressure with a swab on swab holder so that uh, if, there, if there are minimal chances of uh, hematoma form formation. One more thing in axilla, never use spirit uh, to clean because uh, it is very sensitive area and spirit burns a lot especially if the shaving has been done. So just don't use spirit. I, I use only povidone iodine for cleaning. That was uh, excellent, uh, um, Chitra. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I, I actually, I think I underutilized block uh, for uh, the forearm surgeries and uh, uh, surgery on the hand can also be actually done. Uh, yes. with these, and we can do all yeah. the surgeries under tunica also in this particular absolutely, can absolutely. Help of this particular block. Yeah. Yeah. tunica can safely be applied do you do you think um, maybe just uh, say you know like we use tunica for venous access applying a tunica uh, distal to where the block is will help uh, for a proximal spread some people actually, do it that's that why i'm asking has, you actually <laughs> see, that method has been uh, described in theory but practically, I, I haven't seen much of a difference yeah. uh, using tunicate. Yeah. So I particularly, I'm, I'm, I have never used. <laughs> yeah. Because once so, we inject, it is a potential space inside. It is quite a, a, a sort of big, we, uh, we have shown in the anatomy. It is a triangular space, it's quite big. So we may or may not get the paresthesia also, because uh, yeah. there is a lot of uh, fat tissue inside. So yeah. it all depends upon where exactly our needle is inside the Sheet. Yeah. So there are a few questions uh, coming up for you. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is, uh, Suchitra, ma'am, do you block muscular cutaneous centers separately? Uh, Mirza Anwar is asking this question to you. <laughs> uh, yeah. With the uh, with the uh, this this particular landmark guided technique, I can't claim that I'm blocking the muscular cutaneous nerve because it's really it's not in my hands. I, I just go along the direction. But as we can see with the PNS, so most of the times uh, since I've shifted to PNS, I'm using only PNS for auxiliary block. I've just for this particular demo, I, I have used landmark guided because I'm particularly, I'm not very much uh, uh, for landmark guided because, because I prefer to do my surgeries under sole block. So yeah. I need to have a good action. And when I'm not sure that I will be getting good action or not, then definitely I will opt for a method in which the success rate is high. And with PNS, the success rate is high. So, yeah. and there we can definitely, we can uh, see uh, separately block all the nerves, muscular cutaneous, radial, and uh, median and ulnar, means all the four nerves. Yeah. So our own uh, Dheeraj Ailes wants to know, uh, does it make a difference if you inject below the artery or above the artery first? So where no, do you- No, actually it doesn't make any difference, but as I told that uh, the, uh, at the, uh, in axilla, the muscular cutaneous nerve and the median nerve, they are super superior to artery, play superior to the artery. And the radial nerve and ulnar nerve, they are inferior to the artery. In that also, the radial nerve is most deepest. Uh, if you yeah. uh, take the sections, in that yeah. uh, the, it is more deep. And uh, the median nerve is superficial, sort of, and above. And the muscular cutaneous nerve is again deep and away from, because it leaves the shape at the level of coracoid process. So it is a bit far uh, from the uh, shape. 
so we have to go accordingly uh, maybe if uh, uh, if my surgery needs more of a, a median nerve means if it is a volar incision and if it needs more of a, a median nerve action and muscular cutaneous nerve action then i will go superior to the artery and inject the local anesthetic solution but there is no guarantee at all in this because that can spread anywhere in the in the sheath yeah absolutely i think uh, people need to remember uh, two three things uh, one thing um, it's not a single compartment it's a multiple compartment and uh, the uh, nerves the way they lie uh, the radial and ulnar life uh, below the artery and uh, median and muscul uh, muscular cutaneous are above uh, muscular cutaneous comes out uh, much earlier so you need to have a proximal spread and like i have explained axilla actually ends at that point where we giving the block it actually goes up uh, these the apex is into the supraclavicular fossa yes. and and local anesthetic when it spreads proximally uh, will try to catch the muscular cutaneous as well with uh, the blind technique or the landmark technique uh, blind is actually a wrong term to use uh, landmark technique uh, we cannot be 100 percent sure that it will block Uh, the muscular cutaneous uh, or not but giving uh, adequate volume Please, so, uh, and that brings me. to the next question from uh, one of our viewers is say uh, how much total volume of la should be used for axillary block so yeah, ashif uh, please excuse me for a second yeah. someone is on the yeah. door i'll just see yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, i think uh, the uh, volume used uh, should be uh, like when you using landmark techniques we tend to rely on concentration and volume and if you using three uh, nerve uh, for blocking so here we are actually trying to block the radial ulna and median and uh, like I said if you want muscular cutaneous try to inject a slightly larger volume uh, in the uh, above the artery uh, so that you get more spread proximally in the uh, upper compartment and uh, so maybe use 12 to 15 ml and on other nerves you can actually use anywhere from 5 to 10 ml on each nerve uh, again uh, keep in mind uh, the uh, total volume uh, that is the toxicity uh, of the nerve okay yeah so and, is, uh, we can yeah. Uh, use soda bicarb to if we want to uh, get the solution diffused a little bit more but yeah. i usually don't use any adjuncts uh, in yeah. the local anesthetic yeah So again, it is all about time, isn't it? So whether you actually have time uh, for the block to work or not, uh, how rushed you are. Um, so that's why people actually end up, uh, you know, using the mixes like using lignocaine and bupivacan mix to, uh, you know, get. But actually, it doesn't, uh, you know, practically or scientifically, as we explained, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's about like I've explained the core and mental bundle. Uh, theory uh, if you are actually giving a proximal block for a distal uh, surgery uh, please have patience if you're going to rush you will actually end up with failure failure the moment uh, uh, the surgeon actually starts uh, if you give supraclavicular block uh, for a distal radius and you start a surgery within 5 10 minutes and uh, right. the patient will move the hand yeah minimum 20 minutes yeah. we have to wait actually yeah, absolutely so yeah. the time time is actually very very important um yeah so i think uh, you did mention about being intelligent i think uh, uh, knowing the again yeah. again again i'll stress uh, knowing the surgery is very surgical anatomy is very very important you know knowing uh, speaking to the surgeon uh, that where is he uh, doing the surgery uh, which part of the nerves are involved those things are very very important and this comes with experience just because it's not like a spinal anesthesia uh, where it's that is called a shotgun approach kind of thing where uh, you know you blocked everything both limbs are blocked it doesn't matter where what surgery is with individual nerve blocks you have to be very intelligent yeah. you should know which nerve supplies which area which bone which muscle which uh, dermatome so knowing the dermatomes knowing the osteotome knowing the myotomes is equally important for these so uh, next uh, session uh, we from the upper limb uh, we move on to the chest wall uh, this session uh, will be uh, by uh, kala uh, dhairi and myself 
uh, Kala will be talking about uh, the uh, parotid block, uh, Daria about erectus spiny block, and myself on serratus anterior plane block. Um, so uh, we will start off with uh, paravertebral versus erectus spinal block because these actually have a similar kind of anatomy. As uh, most of you would have read, uh, the uh, paravertebral space is actually anterior to the transverse process uh, behind the pleura. And uh, this is where you have the uh, nerve uh, coming out, the main roots coming out and the dorsal ramus is given, the ventral ramus carries on uh, in the sub and the thoracic compartment. Uh, whereas the erector spinal block is actually given uh, more posteriorly, uh, just at the transverse process level. The landmarks are similar as we will explain in a minute. And the nerve exists through, there is a costal transverse foramen uh, through which the nerve exists. And it is said that it is through this foramen that local anesthetic, which is deposited here in the rectus spinae, uh, diffuses uh, to the parietal space. So it takes longer to actually effect. Now the rectus spinal block is from the same as uh, we can give at various levels. And uh, these are the muscles which you go through. So you got the trapezius, and under the trapezius, uh, between the seventh uh, cervical and the first thoracic or the second thoracic. Uh, uh, it is uh, the rhomboid minor. And then from second to fifth thoracic, you have rhomboid major. And there is actually a space between fifth and sixth thoracic vertebrae uh, where uh, the erector spine is lying just under the trapezius muscle. And then comes the uh, below the seventh thoracic, uh, there is latissimus dorsi. Okay, this is I'll explain in a very simple diagram. So if you look at this one, so between the T2 to T5, uh, between the erector spine and the trapezius, you have rhomboidus uh, major muscle. Uh, so when you give a block at T2, this is used for say chronic shoulder pain, upper thoracic pain, um, part of the breast surgery, uh, where you're going to do a bilateral axillary dissection. Then uh, at T5 uh, is used for rib fracture, open thoracotomy, uh, vatslobectomy. Uh, it can be used as a rescue after thoracic epidural failures for cardiac thoracic surgery. Uh, it also can be used for chronic post hepatic neuralgia, chronic uh, post thoracic thoracotomy pain syndromes. Uh, this is actually from where it has come from. The first uh, time erector spinae was used was for a chronic uh, post thoracotomy pain. So between T6 and uh, the uh, T7, uh, there is no muscle between the uh, you know, rectus spinal trapezius. So that's the bare area. Uh, so you just need to go through a single uh, muscle. And between T7 and the T12, uh, you have latissimus dorsi. And, uh, and at T8 level is actually an important uh, landmark. And this is where you would actually give blocks for nephrectomy, hysterectomy, uh, ventral hernias, laparotomies, and rooftop incision. Okay. And uh, between T11 and L2, uh, there then uh, the serratus posterior inferior actually comes in between the latissimus dorsi. Well, there are four muscles actually. They, well, really not, three muscles. Trapezius is actually gone here. So instead of trapezius, uh, you have latissimus dorsi and the serratus posterior inferior uh, uh, before the erector spinae uh, muscle, just posterior to, uh, to this. You can use uh, the erector spinal block at uh, the lumbar level as well for chronic myofascial pain syndrome, facet joint pain, and vertebral surgeries as well. So erector spinae block can be considered as a poor man's period block. It's a safer block. It's a facial plane block. Uh, so it's simpler and safer. Uh, as you've seen, you have multiple indications, but it all depends at what level you're going to give this block. The greatest advantage of this block is that uh, compared to rectus sheath catheters, uh, it provides both somatic as well as visceral uh, analgesia. And you can only, always use a catheter as well. So rectus spinal block will be dealt by, by the area. And uh, uh, in a minute, I have not introduced the area. Sorry, I don't know where his uh, video actually has gone. Uh, Daria is, uh, I'll, I'll introduce him in a minute. Okay. Daria, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So I did actually introduce, introduce you before. So I think yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, what, you told that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. As Sir told, Electra's Pioneer blog is a like a quite a new blog. In the recent years, it is introduced and more used. And uh, if you see the indication of it, the very high indications as Sir told me initially. Uh, in this patient, I am giving uh, uh, for the ventral hernia for the purpose of the postoperative analgesia. I am giving Electra's Pioneer block. As you can see, we have to feel the midline uh, whatever process, and from midline, three centimeter lateral we will go. And from three centimeter lateral, after locally infiltrating, here for the ventral hernia, I have chosen a T8 level, and three centimeter laterally I am just going, as you can see in the video, and I have just locally infiltrated here. Uh, look, because we are going to use a 23 goes spinal needle, as I told, I just go with the introducer, and then I just remove the stilet, and I'm going inside with that. Uh, so here, actually for ventral hernia, I have to go bilateral. Uh, block. Here I am just locally infiltrating for the my spinal anesthesia in the same patient, which I am going to give later. So just I have given a spinal local infiltration of spinal anesthesia also. Yeah. So here, as you can see, I am using 23 go spinal needle, three centimeter laterally. I am just entering from the skin, and I am just passing, and I am in the search of the transverse process. As uh, you can see with the feel, I can hit the transverse process. Uh, here you can see that. Yeah, I am just hitting the transverse process. I am not going, I am just in the periosteum. Okay, uh, if I inject the drug here, I am not able to inject the drug because I am in the periosteum. So I am just withdrawing millimeter or two and then I am just in injecting. So now I am just beyond the electrospinal muscle and in, in between the electrospinal and transverse process. So in that way, I am giving a 20 ml of 0.25% rupee vacuum here. The same way I am giving to the opposite side, and it will cover the, my purpose of the analgesia for the ventral hernia. Uh, uh, the I am using this block for the grip fracture. In that case, I am giving at a T5 level, and same way if the inguinal hernia is there, then a unilateral electrospinal block I am giving at the level of the T11. It is a like quite easy and simple and safe, not in that way. The remaining caramel I am giving. It is a plain block, so we have to facial plain block. We have to give a 20 ml of drug. So amount is a uh, more important here, and it is can be used as a combined. Uh, if uh, I say in my experience, the effect of the block lasted for the 14 to 16 hours. Yeah, it is always with a uh, multiple analgesia yeah? and using the NSAIDs and uh, paracetamol contramol. And with this block, patient really remain very much pain free. Yes. So we will likely take the questions uh, for um, this session together because I think yeah. it's very important. They actually have common indications. Uh, so um, uh, I have already introduced uh, Kala uh, before, and uh, so Kala will be talking about uh, thoracic uh, parotid block. So uh, this is a more advanced block. Uh, but it has been used for years and years. Um, and uh, so Kala, are you there? Yes. Okay, so uh, going to start uh, your video? Yeah. Yeah, you can explain I'll the- I'll go through answer. the landmarks again, properly. Uh, there are three important landmarks for thoracic paravertebral, the spinous process. You have to hit the transverse process and the direction of the needle. For the paravertebral block, you have to go beyond the transverse process as opposed to the erector spinae where you are hitting the transverse process and injecting the drug above the transverse process. You have to understand that the paravertebral place, space is a potential space. It's filled with fibro fatty elastic tissue engulfing the nerves. And the giveaway here is not as similar to your epidural or your spinal. Hence, you have to hit the transverse process before advancing the needle further. One thing you have to important uh, note, uh, note is the prominent spinous process is the C7. The scapular spine coincides with your T3 and your inferior angle of the scapula is at the level of T7. In the thorax, the spinous processes are at the level 
of the transverse process one vertebrae below so if you are uh, feeling for the c7 trans, uh, spinous process and adjacent to it horizontally lies your transverse process of t1 similarly t1 spinous process is at the level of t2 transverse process also the spine is curved in such a way that the deepest level where you get the transverse process is at the cervical and the lumbar regions and from t10 uh, t5 to t10 is the shallowest so you may get the transverse process within 2 to 3 cm of your needle so you have to keep this in mind because you may have an inadvertent pleural puncture okay now with the thumb i so you can begin with the video hello yes yeah uh -huh. see here you can i am giving a multi level paravertebral block for modified radical mastectomy i am marking the spinous process and this is a left sided see the needle has to be perpendicular to the skin planes at all levels i'm using a spine 25 gauge spinal needle i've hit the transverse process and i'm walking off the transverse process caudally to enter the paravertebral space after piercing your superior costo transverse ligament and when you're giving multiple level injection 3 ml of drug is enough so at all levels i have been hitting the transverse process and then walking off caudally from t1 to t7 that is the required area coverage for uh, breast surgeries here i would like sir just a minute here i would like to stress that trans uh, paravertebral block do not cover the entire breast that is your pectoral nerves are spared the nerve to serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi is spared so you have to uh, put, uh, give that uh, infiltration along the supra superior uh, inferior part of your clavicle and the medially along the medial side of this uh, to at uh, the sternum to cover the cross crossing fibers from the opposite side yes sir you can continue knowing the landmarks and again showing a two level injection using a pns where i'm hitting the transverse process at t1 that is feeling for the you can see my finger at the uh, c7 spinous process you can see the contractions of the intercostal nerve at the axilla here i have given 10 ml of the la mixture again at t5 t6 i've hit the transverse process and i'm walking off caudally to enter the paravertebral space behind after piercing the superior costo transverse ligament you can see the intercostal muscle contractions at the t8 t9 level thank you sir so we will be actually uh, doing um, the uh, pns uh, you know symposium yeah. uh, where we will discuss uh, these again like sir we will take uh, the questions uh, after i finish the serratus anterior plane block uh, so uh, the serratus anterior plane block is basically uh, uh, giving local anesthetic uh, either above the serratus anterior that is uh, uh, between the latissimus dorsi and the serratus or um, as in done uh, in the uh, you know landmark technique if it's easier just to hit the hit the fifth rib Uh, come out and uh, inject local anesthetic under the serratus. Now, uh, between the uh, local anesthetic between the latissimus and the serratus, that is done with ultrasound. But saying that, it has been seen that if you deposit local anesthetic under the serratus, uh, the quality of analgesia and the duration of analgesia is better. Uh, so it's easier to just hit the rib, uh, come out and inject local anesthetic. 
So this we actually go at the level of the mid axillary line and the fifth rib. And I can tell you that even in uh, big patients, even like person like me, uh, you know, you can feel my ribs very, very easily. They are actually very easy to feel in the mid axillary line. Uh, you can actually feel the ribs, um, hit the ribs, come out and inject uh, local anesthetic there. The nerve to serratus anterior, that is a long thoracic nerve bell lies uh, above the serratus anterior. Uh, so that will also be uh, blocked uh, by this. So uh, for the, uh, you know, the breast blocks, people have been talking about PAC1, PAC2, SAP. They are just been developments which has happened. Uh, we started off with PAC1, um, it didn't work that well, then went to PAC2, PAC2 is basically PAC1 plus PAC2. And then they all go more uh, sort of proximal near to the nerves to move behind uh, to serratus anterior plane block. So the uh, PEC-1 will actually block your like uh, T1 uh, to maybe T4. Uh, PEC-2 will block uh, because we have PEC-1 and PEC-2, we have T1 to T4. Um, but the serratus anterior plane block uh, gives you a larger area of coverage between T2 to T9. Obviously, depending on the, uh, the volume, volume of local anesthetic uh, used. So we can actually mark uh, the uh, mid axillary line. So here you can see there's the uh, anterior axillary line and mid axillary line are blocked. And uh, the uh, serratus anterior plane block is at the fifth rib level. Uh, in males, it's easy. Uh, females may be difficult, but uh, your nipple area is uh, at the level of uh, the fourth uh, space uh, for rib. So just going below it. It really doesn't actually matter whether you are on the fifth rib, fourth rib, or sixth rib. If you are in and around that, the local anesthetic is going to spread. So you don't have to be that specific uh, for that. So uh, coming uh, to the video itself, you can actually see the needle being, uh, it's very, very superficial, amazingly superficial. You go through the skin, uh, through, uh, you know, in the space, uh, between the uh, lattice mus dorsi and you are straight onto the rib. You go through the serratus anterior on the rib, uh, come out a bit and inject the local anesthetic. So as simple block as that, and, but such great, uh, you know, advantages. Uh, you don't need ultrasound. You don't need anything big, um, just a needle and syringe. You can give a very good block. Uh, volume used, uh, you can use uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.375, 0 0.5. Um, yeah, volume is important. So I would actually use 0.375, that's my common uh, solution. I use bipurecane, sorry, liver bipurecane. Uh, but you can inject 0 0.375, uh, 0 0.25 uh, for analgesia. If you're doing as a sole block, then uh, combined with other blocks, uh, you can use a slightly higher concentration. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, we will come to question answer session uh, on the chest blocks. Uh, so you can ask any questions to uh, Kala, myself, and Theria. Uh, so questions. Uh, let me see if there was any questions on... Uh, I think there was a question. Do you actually feel uh, for uh, paresthesia or uh, tingling uh, when you actually go for uh, uh, thoracic paravertebral color? Do you do you ask see the patients? No, uh, there is no question of paresthesia or tingling, except when I go with the PNS. I have to be very careful because uh, in front uh, there lies the sympathetic chain. Yeah. The patient can suddenly collapse on you if your current is very high. So that is for PNS. But for uh, uh, with plain uh, needle uh, uh, landmark guided, you do not feel any tingling. Or so. I, have, I think a lot of times, I think it's my experience because uh, you tend to actually go one to 1.5 centimeter beyond the transverse process. A lot of times you are actually probably doing a rectus spinal block. Uh, anyway, that was my take on the uh, uh, landmark technique for uh, paravertebral. Uh, so Dr. Naresh Paliwal has asked, uh, which position you find effective for giving uh, thoracic paravertebral blocks sitting on lateral? As for spinal sitting position is more comfortable for anesthetists, 
and little for the patient. Does it really matter, Kala? No, sir. Actually, if I'm giving, I prefer sitting because uh, since I'm in a private practice, I do not get many people to hold on to the patient, brother. Yeah. So if there is only one person, sitting is fine. If I have two, three, so I can give some sedation and lateral will be better. No, but like you said, oh. that if you at least do um, have uh, patients developing uh, kind of, uh, you know, a pain or, uh, you know, they collapse, so wouldn't a little be better than? But saying that in the both position, you need someone to hold yes. them. Yeah. Yes. Can I add, sir? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Naresh. Yes. Uh, do you find the effectiveness same with both positions? Because what happens in lateral position, the spread is to the opposite side, when especially when the multiple levels are not given. Uh, not exactly, sir, because uh, opposite side very rarely. Uh, especially when the injection levels are not multiple. I mean, one or two only are given. I huh. find sitting better in that case. Especially okay, single sir, level uh, sir, when you are in the, the anterior column, see the paravertebral space has two columns, the posterior yes. and the anterior or the ventral column. So if you are in the ventral column, the drug spread is more longitudinally along the uh, paravertebral space. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that actually uh, brings to the question, uh, Dheeraj, I'll ask about multiple injection versus uh, uh, single large injection. And I think that has been proven beyond doubt. This is proven beyond doubt yes. that multiple injections do work better. Yes, yeah. yes they and do work it, better. Yeah. And it's so much so you can notice uh, when the surgeon is operating exactly uh, where the uh, uh, level, which level it has not acted. You can see a nice red band, you know, the hmm. effect of your adrenaline xylocaine is so good. The field is excellent. Otherwise, in a um, uh, mastectomy, you have to chase the BP. You know, the surgeon keeps asking, keeps bleeding, please reduce the BP. And by the time you reduce the BP, he's, uh, and uh, you are uh, set for a good field, he's closing and he's saying, increase the BP. You know? yeah. Yeah. So the, the magic of this is like, surgeon is never complaining at all. Right from mm. the skin, you can make out. Uh, the, yeah. Just in the subcutaneous fat, you can make out. It's nice pale with a BP of 140 by 80 or so. Why should, uh, can I ask one thing? Why should be more spread in the lateral position and uh, like Dr. Dahiria said and uh, not there so anything? No, but there you know. isn't anything. There no, is that, a, that no, is no reason that, uh, why should it happen. No, not, no, not, the, with, not with uh, uh, parotidal or erectus spine, it doesn't matter uh, right. what you yes. get a block. Because it is not like hyperbaric uh, yeah. solution. Yeah. Na, yeah. Baba, yeah. The spread. No, no, but the major pressure. spread uh, doesn't occur more longitudinally. Hmm. It also spreads. The drug goes laterally also. Okay, so. But yeah, slowly it seeps. Lateral and sitting should not mind. Uh, no, not, uh, it doesn't make. Your uh, injection it pressure... It, it spreads with gravity. No. It does not matter. No, it does not I spread. I mean, the volume of the drug is more, so it spreads more with the gravity. No. no it spreads, spreads everywhere at the, the same time. To the epidural space as well. Gravity. No, no, no. Sorry, guys. Sir, and unlike so unlike your spinal yeah. or your epidural, this is not a potential nice space for you where the drug, uh, you know, this is a fibro fatty tissue with your injection, you're creating space. So it's not going to spread very fast. Uh, you know, it's not going to settle down or something. Yeah. There is no effect of gravity or sitting or that. This yeah. is just simple uh, volume and pressure. The more volume you do, Depends on whether you're in the anterior column of the uh, parotidal space or you're in the posterior column. Posterior column is probably as good as a erector spine. Erector spine yes. Second thing is, if you're too lateral, then only you get the little spread along the intercostal space. That means you're not in the right space. And that's why your landmarks are very, very important that you need to be within 2.5 to 3 centimeters uh, lateral to the spine, spinous process. So if your landmarks are, again, that happens with... Uh, ultrasound uh, as well. If people are too lateral, they clean jacked into the, uh, you know, the uh, intercostal space, then you'll get a single uh, level block uh, in the intercostal space. So the lateral spread into the intercostal space is minimal uh, with the 
your uh, proper uh, you know landmark so landmarks are very very important and again volume and uh, it has been seen the spread depends that's why uh, with single injection don't expect that if you give 40 ml it will spread up and down everywhere uh, and that's why multiple injections knowing uh, what is the upper limit of the surgery lower limit of the surgery is very very important uh, for these blocks whether it's erector spinal block or uh, paraverter block multiple levels uh, always give you a better uh, analgesia um, so uh, sir so for the tab block which you explained i just sorry? know in the costal space uh, how deep uh, minimal your quality of sound is actually very poor can you please check what's the problem is because you will need to actually have better quality of uh, i think we're not uh, hearing you properly so her question is how deep would you go for a serratus anterior plane block and also there's a question of what is the volume there is no there is a there is actually a limit you cannot go deep you will actually hit the rib you have to hit the rib and you come out uh, slightly and so and what volume of drug that you would use say for for two ribs or for maybe one whole side so how do you decide on the volume of the drug that you use okay so the volume volume used actually is usually um, uh, using 0.4 ml per kg is the maximum volume you likely use uh, for a good spread so it depends on number of area you want to block so if you want a block uh, which is spread from t2 to let's uh, say t9 level you actually using minimum volume of 20 so you're using 20 to 30 ml uh, for serratus anterior plane block and it's very very important that you are not anterior you have to be either at the mid uh, axilla line or posterior to it if you're anterior to it you won't get as as wide a spread as you get uh, when you are at the mid uh, axillary or just posterior to it the spread here is proximal it need to go uh, under and like said uh, depositing local anesthetic uh, below the serratus anterior actually seems to appear to give a better quality block uh, than uh, over it can i ask one question yeah uh regarding erector spinal block yeah. when we want to give it uh, as a post operative pain relief for vertebral surgeries yeah can we give them in uh, patients who are on uh, anti platelets actually i have been giving yeah but uh, i just wanted to confirm it on the it forum is the safest you can give it if the patient is going to cut through the whole back your yes uh, that's what <laughs> that's what that's what because that and there are no big blood vessels there yes yeah absolutely yeah. we can so you can poke as much as you like and and, and i give them uh, when the orthopedician generally marks the level that time only i give give it uh, so it is generally given under cm control so most of the times it is a uh, single shot i don't need to move the needle you can you can give it any time uh, better any any block need to be given even for analgesia always given before the incision goes yes yeah so always give it before so once the surgeon goes to scrub you can actually give it doesn't take it takes just few minutes uh, to give the block you hit the tarsus process inject local anesthetic uh, give multiple level i won't give a single level i would actually go uh, for multiple levels rather than single level yeah thank you sir any other questions before we move on to the next session i think there isn't any more question uh, i think we have covered uh, most of it yeah so uh, we move on uh, from there to abdomen and perineum here we'll be talking about the tap block and the rectus sheath block iliangular block and we also move on to the perineal area so we'll be discussing about perianal blocks and uh, penile block as well uh, tap block will be by minel i uh, will discuss a bit of rectus sheath block uh, sorry it's not kala but it's dhairya who is going to be talking about iliangular um, that is hernia block uh, uh, dilips Singh Parmar, we call him DSP. Will be talking about perianal block, and Tarun Wagera will be talking about penile block. So, uh, 
uh, going on to a bit of the anatomy part, you need to know the dermatomes uh, in this area, uh, which we know T10 is absolutely at the umbilical level, and then we're in proto-inguinal level. Uh, we're looking at L1. Uh, the epigastric area is the uh, your T6. So we're looking at blocking uh, so sort of uh, T6 to L1 uh, when we're looking at the abdominal blocks. Uh, and uh, for the perianal area, we're looking at more of a sacral and coccygeal uh, area. Uh, so first we will discuss tap and rectus sheath block. And um, the nerves, uh, like I said, we are looking at from T6 to L1. Uh, with tap blocks, we have seen that it tends to block T6 to T10. And there is uh, a sparing which can happen uh, of the L1. So it depends where you are putting your local anesthetic. We are actually below the uh, ribs, that is uh, the subcostal. You're in the classical area uh, between the uh, costal margin and the crest, or you are actually injecting local anesthetic just above the uh, iliac crest. And uh, again, your anterior or posterior, so if you go a bit more posteriorly, uh, which is also considered as the uh, uh, transversalis fascia block or the quadratus lumborum one block. So that is the posterior tap. Again, the spread varies from where you actually inject the local anesthetic. You also need to understand how the actually nerves actually move. So if you're looking at the nerves on the uh, near the costal margin, uh, in that area, the nerves tend to travel further uh, before it actually gets into the transverse abdominis plane. So at T6 level, it is very, very close to the linear elbow. And as we go uh, sort of uh, between T7 to T9, it tends to emerge uh, more laterally. And uh, at the lower end, uh, it is a lot more, so almost at the anterior axillary uh, line. So this is at the area where uh, the nerve is lying in a true transverse abdominis uh, plane. This is a nice dissection, uh, and uh, here you can actually see uh, that the nerves lying below the internal oblique fascia, and they also communicate with each other, and that's why this is also known as the transverse abdominis uh, plexus. Then it pierces uh, the, uh, you can uh, look at uh, the uh, nerves more uh, under the ribs, sorry, uh, rectus muscle, uh, lying over the posterior rectus sheath. I will explain uh, this more clearly when I talk about uh, the rectus sheath uh, block. Uh, so, like I said, uh, you can give, so you can look at uh, the tab block, the transverse abdominis plane block. You can be anterior, you can be a little posterior, and or you can be doing the uh, uh, quadratus lumbar, which is the posterior most block uh, at the transverse salis fascia uh, or plane block. Uh, so Minal is a visiting consultant at the military hospital in Mayo Hospital, Ruki, and uh, she has special interest in regional anesthesia and obstetric anesthesia, and she will be talking about uh, the tab block. Uh, Minal, are you there? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Is it yeah. clear now? Okay, so we will be starting your video. I know you're talking here, so I'm going to just increase the volume before I feel it. Which will be done by the pop tech. So I think we can mute so it for that. I can patient. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now this patient is okay. being taken up for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Go on, Milo. So this particular patient has been taken up for laparoscopic cystectomy. So basically for all the laparoscopic cases, I'm giving the tab block beforehand because post-operatively it will be a little difficult to get the block. We have an ultrasound also, but here I'm giving it with a pop technique, especially for this particular content that we're doing it. Um, I also have to mention that we can use various kinds of needles, as Sir has already told us before. Um, there is a 25 gauge needle, which sometimes I use. Then there is, a, but in this particular situation, I have used the stimuplex needle because it is already blunted. And so here I'll be showing the technique of how to blunt the needle also. I fill two syringes of 0.25% tensorcane, 20 ml, which comes to, and I'm giving 
the block only on one side, which is a left-sided block. So this I'm showing the technique of blending the needle, the padded beaking, which I have explained earlier. Uh, now here I'll be giving the classical approach uh, because this is a laparoscopic cystectomy. Uh, sometimes when when we are going for a cold cystectomy, we go for a uh, subcostal block for so that time. So this I'm showing 25 gauge needle with which you can give. But I'll be finally using the stimulex needle. So the advantage, uh, uh, actually this stimulex needle is already slightly blunt because I've used it before, twice or thrice. It is easier for me to use. As far as explained, there are three, three to four kinds of uh, uh, blocks which we are giving. It is the subcostal, the classical approach, and then the radio inguinal nerve, etc. That will be covered later on. Here, I will be going for. Here, I, I think I'm explaining that we are feeling for the highest point of the left crest, which is the ASIS, and then we are going for the subcostal margin, which I'll be showing on the landmark. So this is the highest point of the iliac crest, which is the ASIS. And then we feel for the subcostal margin. And the midpoint between these two, in the mid axillary line, we actually go with our needle. Okay. And uh, we feel for two forks. We feel for two bounces and then two forks. So when I'm going initially to avoid the cushion effect, actually there is a cushion effect. So I just pull my needle slightly outside and then again go slowly inside the first bounce which i feel is the muscle external oblique when i pass through the fascia that is the external oblique fascia that is the fork the second bounce which i feel is the internal oblique bounce and then when i pass through the fascia is the internal oblique fascia so now i have explained this now we'll go with the procedure I'm doing the, the pinching technique. This is the pound which I feel. And then there's a pop. I don't know. I think so. You can just uh, increase the volume of this itself. Maybe that will be better. This is the drug which I've taken 0.25% sensor cane. I'm doing an aspiration. There's no blood. It should go smoothly and it is going smoothly. It is coming back also, which means it is in the right plane. Again, take another one and I will give her six, seven more. Post-operatively, after this whole thing, when I asked the patient, when the patient got up because I had given the patient GA, I asked her if there is any pain and she was completely pain-free. Uh, of course, I had also supplemented with multimodal analgesia, uh, but I think the flashlight is too strong on top, so maybe uh, the bounce and the pop probably was not very, very clear. Uh, yes, sir. That's fine. No, that's, that's fine, I mean, Lika, and I can continue. About the rectus sheet block, sir? No, no, no. Uh, you're talking about a tap block, your experience? Yes, yes, yes. So I was saying, so uh, So basically, uh, yes, sir, that, that's about it. So the first, when you're when you're going inside, sometimes you know the, the cushion effect happens, which is very common with the tap block actually. So when you're going inside, you have to actually either you go inside, and what I do normally is I pull out my needle slightly, you know, into the skin, yeah. and then I slowly go, and then I feel for the first bound, and then I feel for the pop, which is the external oblique fascia. Then again I go slowly and I feel for the bound, 
which is the internal oblique fascia, uh, inter uh, internal oblique muscle, and then I feel for the second round, and which is where I normally uh, deposit my drug. And as I was showing it, which was not very clear, I think, in the video, that the back flow is so, uh, you know, you, you can see all the drops coming back, which means you're in the correct plane, which is the tap plane. Yeah. So as I mentioned, this is for laparoscopic cystectomy, so I'm giving it in the classical place. If it is for cholecystectomy, I go subcostally. Subcostal yeah. means you uh, take the anterior axillary line and the subcostal margin, and you go about uh, one to two centimeters medial to the anterior axillary line, just below the subcostal margin, and you deposit it there. Okay? Yeah. But most of the time, uh, all the ports which are going in are we have a you know supra umbilical port sometimes or an infra umbilical port so this this works best when it is combined along with a rectus tape block. No, yeah, I'm going to go go through that uh, now and uh, I think uh, we will have a discussion session at the end and I have actually I think a demonstration for subcostal as well in a minute. So coming to the rectus sheath block. So it's uh, important to actually understand uh, the difference um, at uh, the rectus sheath. So if you look at the rectus sheath, uh, anterior uh, part is uh, formed by the external oblique fascia and the internal oblique fascia actually splits into two parts and uh, it combines with the internal oblique fascia to form the anterior rectus sheath. And uh, in the then it uh, uh, combines uh, with the uh, uh, transversalis fascia uh, to form the posterior rectus sheath. And it is uh, above the posterior rectus sheath uh, where we tend to deposit the local anesthetic. Then uh, below the arcuate line, okay, just below the umbilicus, uh, there is no posterior rectus sheath. Okay, so uh, there's no point actually depositing local anesthetic below the umbilicus. Uh, it's not going to actually be helpful. The uh, area below the umbilicus can be easily done uh, with a lower uh, tap block. So that's how the nerve travels. So the nerves travels through the transversal, uh, you know, uh, through the uh, transverse abdominis plane, and then uh, it uh, lies uh, below the, uh, you know, the rectus muscle above the uh, posterior rectus sheath, and that's why uh, the local anesthetic need to be deposited above the uh, posterior rectus sheath. Uh, landmarks are obviously important, and um, the on the right side you can actually see uh, the uh, you know, epigastric area. The umbilicus is on the left side of the screen, and uh, we have put the marks on. And like I said, uh, the nerve tends to enter motorly uh, near the uh, lower part of the abdomen, and is much closer uh, at the top. So that's, that's where we actually going to do block. Now we also remember that uh, the rectus sheath, um, there are intersections uh, which divide uh, the rectus posterior uh, compartment into a uh, few planes. So we need to be actually careful about uh, that as well. And that's why we normally give uh, sort of four quadrant blocks so that local anesthetic tends to simply spread uh, more than that. So this was just like looking at uh, the various uh, landmarks. So uh, this is the uh, block. So we actually near the, para, this is the paraumbilical rectus sheath block. We go through the anterior rectus sheath. Uh, this is actually showing using a stimuplex needle, uh, which has got a uh, short bevel and deposit the local anesthetic above the uh, rectus sheath. Okay. Uh, this is uh, with the hypodermic needle. Uh, you feel uh, for the bounce, uh, go through the anterior rectus sheath, and uh, then you need to, okay. So you actually see a pretty good uh, pop through the anterior rectus sheath, which is actually pretty tough. And then you go through the muscle and then feel for the bounce on the posterior rectus sheath. So you don't pierce, you don't pierce the posterior rectus sheath. You need to just feel the bounce, not the pop. And then you actually inject local anesthetic over the anterior rectus sheath. Sorry, posterior rectus sheath. Uh, the anterior rectus sheath is actually quite tough, and you get a very nice bounce uh, when you go through the anterior rectus sheath. And again, uh, here we will show uh, what Minel was describing how you see a backflow. 
Now, if you are in the muscle, you will not see a backflow. There you go. You can see the fluid coming out. Uh, that shows that it's in the right plane. Okay. So that is the uh, trick about, so if you're not sure whether your uh, needle has uh, gone uh, or is in the facial plane, this is what you can actually do. Once you're given few MS, first five MS, disconnect the syringe and see uh, whether local anesthetic is uh, you know, coming back. Uh, if it's not coming back, then you have actually done an intramuscular injection of the local anesthetic. So it's a nice uh, thing which is not described. This is what uh, was uh, Minil was talking about uh, subcostal block. Uh, so you actually are just under that. Uh, this is a pinching of the uh, you know muscle. You go through the uh, uh, fact, the skin and fat. So there is no uh, you know cushion effect. This is pinching, and you're straight onto that. You can actually see the bounce here. You feel the bounce, and you will actually feel a click. Okay. Then again. Uh, feel for the second bounce and you feel for the second click. There you go. Okay, and you inject uh, the local uh, anesthetic in there. Okay. So uh, the uh, third part of the abdominal block is the iliunguinal and iliohypogastric nerve. And this is the L1. Now, L1 is easily spared in the classical uh, tab block. So if you're doing a block uh, more uh, near to the uh, Halley crest, then you tend to block L1. Or you can actually give the classical, uh, the hernia block. Illuminal iliohypogastric nerve block will be covered by uh, Daria. And uh, we have already introduced uh, him to you. So the iliohypogastric nerve and iliunguinal nerve, uh, they come from L1. The L1 actually went from the ventral division of L1, uh, divides into iliohypogastric iliunguinal. Iliohypogastric can also get a branch from the T12. Now, there are many variations uh, uh, seen in the origin of the iliunguinal and iliohypogastric nerve. Uh, you can see uh, that there are almost uh, nine to 10 variations actually seen in this uh, division. So. Uh, you can get sparing, uh, you can actually get, uh, you know, ineffective blocks. Uh, the landmark we tend to use is more uh, different from the classical one. Uh, this is more like a, a iliunguinal iliohypogastric in, in the transverse abdominis plane. Uh, you feel for the anticipalic spine go five centimeter cranially and five centimeter posteriorly. Uh, this is Ascherberger point. And uh, at this level, uh, both the nerves are lying within the same plane. But as you move uh, more distally, uh, the iliunguinal nerve uh, then pierces the internal oblique muscle and lies between the internal oblique and uh, the external oblique. So you need to give two level blocks when you're giving in a classical approach, which the area will actually show in that. The other important thing is that when you are actually going uh, near to the uh, anticipated spine, uh, if you don't feel the two pops properly, uh, if you don't obliterate the, or you don't take care of the cushion effect, and you inject uh, the local anesthetic uh, over the transversalis fascia, that is below the uh, transverse abdominus muscle, the local anesthetic can seep in this plane and actually reach the uh, femoral nerve. So you can have patients who do not get uh, the hernia block, uh, but end up with a femoral block, uh, intraoperatively, you end up supplementing uh, with sedatives or ketamine and whatnot, and or ask surgeon to infiltrate. And when patient is ready to walk, uh, walks up and he actually falls. This has actually happened in real life. So this complication need to be kept in mind. So there you are. are you there for the yeah, video? I'm here. Yeah. Okay. I'm here so, so here we're going to play your video. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Uh, here, as I'm showing. Uh, we have, first of all, the landmark initial landmark is the anterior superior iliac spine. For the blocking the iliopagastric and iliopagastric now, we are going two centimeter medial and two centimeter cranially from the anterior superior iliac spine, as I have shown there. Okay, so with that point, we get our desired point of entry. Now, uh, for that, we have to blunt the needle because here we are going to do the LOR. So with the style bow, I am just hitting my needle two to three times and my, get, my needle gets adequately blunted. So I can perceive that uh, loss of resistance here. 
okay yeah so now here after just entering the scheme as you can see i am just entering the scheme sub q and external oblique i just feel pop up so now i am in between the external oblique and internal oblique now. so here i am going to block my ilio inguinal now so atml of the drug is given here now after giving this drug it is become little difficult to further forward the needle inside okay so we have to be really very careful because now there is a volume of the drug is there so now again i am just going just hitting just going now i am in between the internal obliques and transverse abdominal muscle here i am going to hold ihn ilio hypogastric now an 8 ml of the drug is given here now if the i am conducting the whole case and the just hernia block and 0.5% bupivac i am going to use here and if it is for the analysis purpose i am using 0.25% with this i will also like to infiltrate from the umbilicus to the pubic symphysis just a to infiltration and uh, if it is needed i just hand over some local anesthetic and if it is needed then just a sheath infiltration by the surgeon if it is needed so in that way completely hernia surgery is very easily done without much sedation under the hernia block uh there you do you also likely ask the uh, surgeon to uh, infiltrate the cord for general femoral yes yes sir yes sir i i just asked the surgeon to infiltrate the cord sometimes but if the old patients are i have just encountered this if the patients are old age patients then it is not much required in the young patient yes it is required to cord infiltrate cord infiltration for the general femoral okay so uh, minal are you there as well uh so this is the question time uh, before we move to the perineal blocks um, so any questions on tap block on rectus sheath block or on uh, the uh, hernia blocks uh, we can actually take that questions uh, rectus sheath block indications sorry rectus sheath block indications specifically uh, like we have said uh, if you are actually need a whole of the abdomen then uh, you need to actually use combination of the uh, rectus sheath and the uh, tap tap block so for example if you are actually doing uh, uh, say uh, uh, laparoscopic cholestectomy then uh, you need to give subcostal tap to cover the ports uh, which are there in the epigastric area and uh, in the uh, just uh, you know they have uh, in the subcostal area then you need to give the paraumbilical rectus sheath block uh, uh, that is the main one that actually causes most pain in uh, laparoscopic patients even though surgeons tend to infiltrate that area if you give uh, a block in that uh, area then you don't need to actually use i've never used any opiates in any of my laparoscopic cholestectomy patient i just use paracetamol dexamethasone diclofenac magnesium sulfate and that actually covers the the pain so if you give good blocks uh for these areas then you actually uh, don't need to um so you can use rectus sheath block also for uh, paraumbilical hernia surgeries not a big ones uh, because they might ex extend then you might actually have to uh, use a combination of both uh, so higher rectus sheath and uh, tap low tap blocks but you can use that for that so but for laparoscopy sir uh, we will need multiple points won't be laparoscopic yes. surgery we will have to have yeah. multiple so points need, of injection there yeah so you need to actually do uh, like i said uh, uh, rectus sheath block is always done at multiple points uh, yeah so you will likely do a paraumbilical uh, uh, rectus sheath block and you will do a epigastric area because that's where the ports are mm -hmm. and then you do a subcostal tap uh, sir i would like to add here yes yeah. you have to give a uh, multiple prick and that is how we have to decide about the dosage of the drug also yes yeah. so you know, if you are giving about 10 ml in the say in the classical tap and then if you are going on <laughs> In the midline for the rectus sheath, you give five five ml in the paraumbilical, and if there is another port which is uh, which is somewhere down below, we again give five five ml there. So we have to keep balancing 
and that is our thing is that we should try to give maximal analgesia as much as possible that is why we are trying to cover the rectus sheath in the middle along with the tap because only then the patient will get full effect of our block not just the tap not just the rectus sheath does so, it uh, oppose the does it oppose the co2 response very well no it, sorry the co2 response that we get hypertension tachycardia yeah. hypertrophic i've never does never it definitely it does at least uh, whatever i have seen yes it definitely does blunt the response not the co2 okay. but yes the hypertension or the hypertension is because of the increase in co2 ptco i am yes. talking here about the pain the the analgesia part is being taken care along with the mma also the multimodal analgesia which we are providing of course yes. You know, we are giving yeah, I am interested because in laparoscopy, I used spinal, and then I did not see in ten patients any hypertension, anything. Very surprisingly, so I was thinking that why not give GA with a block? Yeah, all I uh, uh, always very give surprising it. response. Yeah, I've never actually seen a hypertensive response with uh, laparoscopy. The the response hypertensive response in laparoscopic can be for many reasons co2 is not yeah. the only reason uh, because co2 response you only see later on you don't see it in the initial the second thing is that is the stretch of the abdomen wall and the peritoneum okay so yeah if you actually blocking that's why uh, there are there are two ways so either you do the rectus sheath and the subcostal tap block or you do four quadrant there is another uh, thing that we call four quadrant tap block so where you do the tap block at the uh, subcostal and then you do tap block uh, lower down at the L1 yeah. level so you are actually blocking T6 to T10 or uh, below okay that is that is how you actually do it so if the whole of the abdomen is actually blocked then you actually don't see the stretching effect the initial yeah 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 also i mean how quickly the uh, abdomen is insufflated that is also uh, one of the factors the co2 response only comes later because absorption does not co2 absorption does not happen immediately it happen later on thank you yeah so you can so with the spinal you won't see it because you would have already called hypertension anyway isn't it whether you block the abdominal wall <laughs> muscles or yeah. not you already cause hypertension But patient is not yeah. respiration comfortable hypotension bradycardia i don't know this something very unusual no so so if you actually give you the block and you need to give the multimodal analgesia very early on in laparoscopic surgery so you start your paracetamol uh, diclofenac uh, magnesium sulfate uh, at the beginning itself yeah yeah you do not wait for later on most of the a good surgeon actually finish their surgery within 20 to 30 minutes yes may i add a little bit here yeah now in the covid era many of us have started doing a lot of laparoscopic surgeries under regional anesthesia most under spinal sometimes we do add an epidural component if the spinal action is you know taking if the surgery is taking too long or expected to take long we do put in an epidural catheter and uh, one of the things i like to practice is as soon as the first couple of ports go in once they see the camera i prefer that they instill a little bit of uh, local anesthetic sub diaphragmatically that uh, sort of you know blunts the patient's response to pain because immediately once they start with the trocar when they go in and they inflate so much it becomes difficult for the patient they end up with shoulder pains so that sort of blunts it along with whatever sedation that we are using whether it is uh, dexket or whatever else that we like to use um here again i prefer to do this at the start start of surgery and towards the end of surgery is when i place my tap and the rsb and whatever is required so by the time it is time for the blocks the initial uh, instill instilled uh, this has been absorbed and uh, sort of excreted by the system so i like to preeti are you talking about uh, doing the surgery just under regional uh, laparoscopic surgery under regional yes sir so in those cases i prefer okay. to place my blocks post operatively that doesn't matter because if you have already given given uh, spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia you have already blocked the noxious stimulus so in that case whether you give block at the beginning or at the end it doesn't make a difference so it's only for post operative uh, analgesia it has uh, yeah. 
I don't use it for surgery. That's what I'm saying. So the yeah. this question of blunting of response during. Uh, uh, you can give it at the beginning. It doesn't doesn't actually matter if you are not exceeding the toxic limit. You can actually give at the beginning as well. It's not especially with spinal. You're not using much of local. Then you can you can use it because yeah, this surgery you are not going to um, you know when a surgeon is going to take twenty to thirty minutes. Uh, the half life of bupivacaine uh, is around 180 minutes, so you're not even even actually metabolized half of that dose. So you you as long as you are actually within tox limit, you are fine. So giving it the beginning or the or the end. So you can go down on the concentration and up on the volume. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I use 0.25 percent for abdominal blocks because uh, volume is very very important there. So you don't have to actually go for, uh, and that's why if you're doing doing it under uh, regional uh, along, I think that that's a good idea to if you use a combination of uh, uh, spinal epidural or whatever. I think that's that's important. You can't just rely on uh, just blocks for um, uh, you know doing it solely on the blocks. Blocks, are, yes, you're right. That's for mostly uh, postoperative analgesia. Yeah. I think uh, there is a remark uh, by Dheeraj who says, important to understand anatomy again, infra umbilical midline is not covered by rectus as there's no rectus sheath, uh, posterior rectus sheath actually uh, below. And that is a fair point. And uh, supra uh, umbilical transverse incision needs blocking of uh, subcostal tap, which uh, I think we have stressed. And um, Sajit, says, I agree, the compartments are always probably ill-defined, I think. Yeah, okay, he was talking about, uh, I think, uh, thoracic paravertebral and electrospinal uh, block. Uh, so we haven't got actually many, very many questions uh, for that. Uh, difference between hernia block and tap block, right? And uh, this is Ronak uh, has asked this question. Now, hernia block, basically here, hernia block, means giving ilioinguinal, iliohepagastic nerve block along with genitofemoral femoral nerve block. That is hernia block. You can also block the ilioinguinal, iliohepagastic nerve uh, as described uh, by Ashwamega uh, which is five centimeters uh, cranial to the antiscalic spine and posterior to uh, that. So that is the Ashwamega point. At this point, uh, you actually have both nerves lying in the single plane. Uh, you tend to actually block uh, the iliunguinal iliohepagastic with a single injection. Uh, so that is the uh, hernia block in a single plane or TA plane. Uh, you will still have to do the uh, genitofemoral femoral nerve block, uh, which you can do it yourself or you can ask the surgeon. Most people will let, let the surgeon do the genitofemoral. femoral, that is the uh, giving local anesthetic on the call. Uh, I think uh, with this, we move on to the next session, which is a, a perineal blocks, that is a perianal and the uh, dorsal nerve penis block. Uh, the first one uh, will be the perianal block, uh, which will be by Dilipsin Parmar or DSP as we call him. So we are actually looking at uh, putting local anesthetic in the anal triangle. And this is a diagram of the uh, anal triangle in males and females. And uh, here we are looking at uh, blocking the inferior rectal nerves and the uh, perineal branches of S4 nerves. And that's what uh, we're going to do in this. Um, the ops and gynae people actually are very... Uh, look, guys. Um, yeah. So they tend to block the perineal nerve. The, the perineal nerves are branches coming from uh, the perineal uh, nerve. Uh, they tend to either block it uh, through uh, the vaginal wall or through the skin. Uh, they feel for the uh, you know ischial chidrosity and or ischial spine, uh, rather uh, they go near the ischial spine and deposit local anesthetic. So you can do that if you actually are well versed with it. But uh, here we're talking about the perianal uh, block uh, where we go through uh, you know uh, the uh, ischial rectal fossa and uh, you pierce the fascia lunata and deposit local anesthetic between the facial lunata and the levator ani. 
So this is just uh, showing the same graph. So this uh, inferior rectal nerves and the perino uh, branch of the S4 actually are blocked uh, for this. Um, another diagram. So we are just 1.5 to 2 centimeters uh, from the anal canal, and uh, we tend to go around 4 to 5 centimeters uh, deep, 2.5 to uh, 4 to 5 centimeters deep. You can actually feel a click because uh, the amount of fat in the rectal fossa will depend on the size of the patient. So that's not absolute. So uh, there are uh, two techniques. You can do four injection technique. Uh, where you have injection at 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, or 10 o'clock, or just do a uh, two-injection technique at 3 at 9 o'clock position. So uh, over to Dilip. Uh, uh, DSP is a freelancer anesthetist intensivist in Madhya, Gujarat. Uh, his area of interest is uh, labor analgesia, obstetric anesthesia, uh, and intensive care. And uh, he has recently started his own intensive care unit. So over to you, Dilip. Um, are you ready with your? Yes, sir. Okay, so over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. This video is showing a PNS guided pudental nerve block, or you can say PNS guided perianal block. Uh, this is showing a two injection technique. You have to mark the uh, injection site at the three o'clock and nine, nine o'clock. Uh, take a 1.5 inch uh, uh, needle and insert the whole uh, whole length of needle in a 2.5 centimeter lateral to anal verge. Uh, then deposit 2 to 3 ml of LA. Withdraw the 1 centimeter needle. Then again deposit uh, 2 to 3 ml LA. Then again withdraw 1 centimeter needle and deposit 2 to 3 ml uh, of local anesthetic. So. Uh, this block always should be performed bilaterally and I, I can tell you uh, uh, this is a field block and it, ha uh, it has a superior uh, analgesia compared to PNS guided block. When you perform it is by landmark technique, it has a superior analgesia. I will tell you why. So uh, sometimes uh, inferior rectal nerve that arise from the sacral plexus uh, it uh, it may it may be the reason for your failure. It is sometimes it is uh, uh, it is not a branch of pudendal now, uh, and uh, anal uh, mucocutaneous junction around the anal it is supplied by uh, 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 anal now, sometimes inferior cranial now. Uh, so there might be chances of that uh, uh, pudendal now block alone pudendal block is not sufficient. So this is the block where landmark guided block is much more superior, safe, and effective than PNS guided block. Okay, sir. Yeah, yeah, sounds sounds uh, good. Uh, so uh, uh, to the question answer session. Uh, so like uh, what uh, DSP was saying that when you actually do uh, uh, this uh, landmark technique, whether you do uh, four point or uh, Two point uh, technique. You are actually blocking multiple nerves closer to the uh, uh, the anal canal. Okay, so uh, it tends to actually provide very good analgesia uh, for surgeries uh, like uh, you know uh, when they come, patient comes uh, uh, with uh, you know anal fissures, you know, which are, can be very painful. I think they they are fantastic. Uh, hemorrhoidal surgery, post hemorrhoidal surgery gives you. Uh, accident analgesia, isn't it? So, uh, Dilip, where, which surgeries do you use this block? It seems to actually do uh, quite a few of these blocks. Amaridectomy, anal stretching, and uh, low-level fistula, sir. Fistula. Low-level fistula, yeah. Okay, and how do you have uh, experience with this? The post-operative analgesia lasts up to 16 to 24 hours in my experience, sir. And uh, what... Heart medicine. What Heart medicine. Rupi, we can point to purpose. Okay, Rupi, we can come. One question. Yeah, go on. Of the three methods that he is uh, two o'clock, five o'clock, and all, and then two and nine, uh, three and nine, and two one three. PNS guide. Which one is easy? Because I started using chlorprocaine, patient complaints at the end. Then they come out of it, sudden, sudden uh, awakening. So no, I sorry, want, say again. Which one is easy? Chlorprocaine, when I use for 
hemorrhoidectomy, they just come out and then pain is severe. So wanted to use this block. And uh, block, yeah. two, uh, uh, three o'clock and nine o'clock, at what depth and what, uh, how far away from the anal verge? Two to two point yeah. five centimeter away from the anal verge. And you have to insert the full length of 1.5 inch needle in the ischiorectal fossa. Oh. See, this is a fill block. Uh, it's a potential space. You can direction, direction, direction. Uh, it's a perpendicular or a little laterally. One perforate. Uh, there are chances of internal pudendal artery hematoma. Anything? Uh, okay. Uh, is that uh, in obese patients? Uh, do you need more depth? Uh, may, more longer needle? Because yes, as sir, sir, of that, sir, uh, sir said, you can feel a pop up of facial lunata and you can no, deposit no, no, a level. But uh, apart from 1.5 inches needle, long yes, needle, sir. do you use any other needle like lumbar puncture needle? Because sometimes it can be a lot of tissue over there. See, madam, you have to anesthetize the uh, rectal submucosa, perineal tissue, and subcutaneous tissue beneath, uh, near the mucocutaneous junction. You have to block a tree level. So, so what depth uh, means uh, can uh, because I, I just want to ask that only 1.5 inches depth is sufficient or sometimes you have to go deeper also. No, ma'am, my patient have low BMI. Madam, can I answer this? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah, tell yes, yes. Uh, uh, madam, uh, most of the time when they are giving lithotomy, the skin is stretched over the ischial tuberosity. So you can easily palpate the ischial tuberosity and your aim is to go towards ischial spine that is inside. Okay. No. So when you cross the ischial tuberosity, you are piercing the facial lunata and you enter the ischiorectal fossa. Hmm. So you get most of the time you by compression also that the region, the uh, tissue is easily compressible and you can easily feel you keep the finger at the tuberosity compressed so that you don't need a longer needle. Most of that I use the hypodermic needle 21 gauge which comes along with the 20 cc syringe. So my dose is uh, filled, a drug is filled and give 10 tins ml on each side that is two point injection that's sufficient. Yeah, absolutely. And that answers Dr. Rana's question also. No, but that these... you are reaching too much in the depth. I don't want to go that because I am not sure about it. So is it No, possible? you have to go have... flush, perpendicular flush to the ischial yeah, tuberosity straight inside. Was, take a one inch needle and infiltrative block at three o'clock and nine o'clock yes. across fanning across vertically. Both sides. Can it block? Yes, yes. It can be very that effective. That is what my plan was. So that's what I'm saying. When you give your spinal, what I do is I give it pre-open. I mean, pre, uh, just after my spine oh, yeah. position is done, painted, draped, and I give my block. So it it acts by the time the surgery is over. I want it just 100% safety, that's all. Uh, here it's also we are using... Dr. Rana, it's the same safety as you have described. I think this is much safer than your uh, supraclavicular <laughs> block. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there isn't, there isn't, there isn't plura, there isn't, there isn't plura there to actually puncture. Yeah, but that is as a safe. Sir, it is so safe. Seeing yeah. me, sometimes I forget by some other phone calls or something. My staff gives it themselves. They have seen me so many times. They give it themselves, no? <laughs> this is a blog of BMS and DHMS. They are performing. Yes. performing. <laughs> uh, sir, uh, like uh, here. <laughs> I Very used to add a dexona, dexamethasone yeah. for the longer yes. duration. Very and uh, but but uh, I found that some of the uh, here some of the surgeon also giving the same block. Yes. And they are adding a methylene blue for the longer duration of action. And they claim that 24, 36 hours. So I have actually no idea, but really it lasts long with methylene blue or something like that. Oh, that I think yeah. the patient keeps on uh, checking the. Blue uh, I have they followed have this. I have followed the pain relief. They go up to 36 hours with Dexona. And uh, even Killing for an blue. abscess, if I give two point, the patient is able to travel to Ireland post. Okay. <laughs> and he mails me from there. I think I don't need anything more than... Uh, yeah. Absolutely. How about Dexona? Dexa, four milligram. Okay. Four milligram, yeah. I, I routinely give... I don't that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think... Uh, 
dexamethasone along with local anesthetic in that area is actually fine. You're not actually near to the, any big plexus or nerves. Even though people actually have been using dexamethasone along with local anesthetics to prolong the analgesia, yeah, even for brachial plexus, interscalene, supraclavicular, you know, they have used it for. But if you're doing it uh, for with anesthesia, you can use it IV as well and take advantage of his uh, anti yeah. Okay, so uh, from the perineum, we move on. Well, we still got uh, penal block uh, by uh, Tarun So, uh, uh, so dorsal nerve appendix is what we are actually looking at blocking uh, for uh, the penile surgery. And uh, you basically, uh, there are technique, different techniques, but uh, in the classical technique, uh, you go almost feel the pubic symphysis, you hit it, uh, come out, change the angle, and actually go into the space, uh, which is basically the buck fascia, which has divided and formed like a triangular uh, space. So deposit local anesthetic around each side of the suspensory ligament. Okay. So which is formed from the buck fascia. Uh, you don't actually have to, uh, you know, go and seek the nerves. Uh, as such, the space is actually good enough uh, to do this block. So very good block for circumcisions or surgery. Uh, so it's used commonly in children uh, for surgery so far, but uh, surgeries like phimosis and, you know, you can also use for that. So Tarun is a freelance anesthetist, is an Afsari in Gujarat. Uh, he's also an active member of ISC secretary, uh, Nafsari uh, city branch. And his area of interest is in liver analgesia. Uh, he's uh, very uh, proficient in blind nasal intubation. He's also been using segmental spinal, which he has discussed quite a few times. And he also provides anesthesia uh, for oncosurgery. Uh, Tarun, are you there? Yeah. Okay, over to you. Okay, this is uh, for the uh, phimosis of the penis for circumcision posture. Uh, along with the pile surgery. So I have given uh, saddle blocks and for analgesia purpose, I have given the uh, uh, penile block. First of all, this palpate the uh, two tubercle, uh, pubic tubercle, then on the midline above the pubic symphysis, just insert the needle uh, and redirected towards the one o'clock on the right side or 11 o'clock on the left side. And just give four, four ml injection uh, either side and two ml in the midline. The, that will cover the dorsal nerve of uh, penis. This is on the 11 o'clock position. Just aspirate it and give it. The drug should is a BP vaccine. Uh, I have not used any adrenaline or uh, like any vasoconstrictive agents. So bilaterally, you have to just from one injection, you, you can inject bilateral uh, dorsal nerve. And from the midline also, you have to just imp, uh, inject some uh, drug one to two ml. To, uh, for complete uh, blocks. And uh, sometimes on the prepuzal part, it is not covered by the dorsal nerve proof. So we have to supplement with the ventral nerve or paraurethral ventral side, paraurethral blocks. So just, uh, <laughs> so just inject it 1 to 2 ml huh? of uh, injection either side of the uh, ventral part. To complete the preposal part of the skin to cover. Now the patient is completely uh, analgesia or anesthesia for the circumcision is ready. What are you feeling for there, Tarun? Uh, no, they not feeling. Just uh, giving the massage, and that uh, sister has re started recording. On. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, questions uh, for uh, Tarun uh, for dorsal nerve penis block. Um, any any questions? Isn't it a bit higher than the uh, base of the penis? Because base of the penis is where we go for the exposure. You are a little bit away from it. On to the abdominal wall. Is dorsal, it... dorsal nerve or ventral part? Dorsal. Yeah. No, that is, no, that is there. He's, he's part of the pubic, to, uh, sorry, the sympathetic pubis, isn't it? 
Yeah. Uh, but the classical picture is transfer section from the penis. Is giving in the skin. No, no, just about the, the needle uh, from the skin. The, about from the root. No. One centimeter on the pubic symphysis. Classical yeah. picture is on uh, because I what I used to give yeah. when that. 26 to the 30, in the 26 number, half inch needle, five syringe, take the penis in hand and on to the root of the penis, both bilaterally, whatever way you do it. Buxvesia penetration, just three millimeter and inject. It works that way. So, you it, can uh, many, there are different ways of actually doing it. What uh, Tarun has described is a classical. Uh, way of actually doing the dorsal nerve penis block. This is what is described in the books. You can actually hold the penis and actually, uh, yes, you can actually uh, uh, go hit the transverse process, uh, sorry, uh, symphysis pubis and uh, uh, from center go on either side. You can do as a ring block. You can also do it like a ring block. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there are different methods of actually doing the uh, uh, dorsal nerve penis block. Even if you just infiltrate local okay. anesthetic from the midpoint, and go along the, uh, you know, under the skin, you will still block the nerves. So it can be done. In the shaft, I thought volume would be less as well as success would be higher. You, so can, combine, you can combine both. Actually, you can combine oh. both. I tend to actually do it from one single point uh, in patients. So like what Tarun has done uh, from the same point, instead of uh, going uh, from the, you know, another injection from the ventral point. point. Yeah. yeah. Just go from the dorsal point uh, where you uh, do what the base. inject. Skin is very lax in that area, so you can inject local anesthetic very easily. Nice. Okay. Any any other question or any other uh, things which uh, the faculty would like to actually add uh, to the uh, discussion or to no or or even on perianal block. Um, so this, those are the two common uh, blocks in the perianal area. Obviously, I would think caudal block uh, covers uh, this area very well, uh, or even uh, uh, you know saddle block also can be used. Uh, so these are just additional blocks which people need to actually do it. Like in children, you put them to sleep and give caudal block uh, that actually works equally well and uh, has got good analogies here. But I think this is something uh, which uh, uh, we uh, need to know. I mean, I uh, tend to do this with, uh, for we do get patients, adult patients uh, with phimosis circumcision. And I have got a, a YouTube video about that. Obviously it's uh, in a model of a penis block. Uh, it's not actual actual block where like uh, here Tarun has shown. So, if there are no more questions on this, then we can actually move on to the next section. So we now below the belt uh, to the lower limbs. Uh, the last two uh, sections are on uh, the facial iliac component block and ankle block. Now lower limb blocks, um, you know, lower limbs can be anesthetized so easily uh, with uh, spinal anesthesia. So and they're so short, so, uh, short uh, that these blocks uh, are either used uh, for you know, facial acre block for as a supplement or for uh, you know providing post-op analgies here. Angle block is more for uh, obviously uh, pole foot surgeries. Uh, so the lower limb, uh, if you look at the nerves, the main nerves, uh, the femoral nerve, which actually supplies uh, both the joints rather all three joints uh, of the uh, you know, your hip joint, knee joint, and the ankle uh, joint, uh, lots of uh, branches to the muscles and that. Um, obturator nerve uh, supplies mainly the hip joint and does uh, uh, provide a branch uh, to the knee joint. And uh, sciatic nerve obviously is uh, one of the main nerves of the posterior uh, compartment. Uh, supplying the hip joint, uh, the knee joint, uh, and it's uh, the main nerve for the ankle uh, joint. 
So coming to the anatomy of the, uh, the fascia iliaca, uh, obviously uh, we're trying to block the femoral nerve, uh, little cutaneous nerve, uh, obturator nerve may or may not be blocked uh, with fascia iliaca. Uh, so uh, this is uh, landmarks uh, which Ganesh will talk you through, uh, but idea is to actually feel a pop through the fascia lata and then through the fascia iliaca and deposit a large amount of local anesthetic. There has been a comparison study uh, where people try to see uh, whether uh, you will actually get all the three nerves uh, by injecting local anesthetic. Uh, there is a comparison between three in one block, which is a group one block here and uh, the facial echo block. And it has been seen that uh, the facial echo block tend to uh, spread over the iliacus. So the uh, purplish area and uh, the pink area or the red area so uh, A and B compartment, and that's why uh, it tends to block uh, the uh, femoral and lateral cutaneous uh, more consistently. Uh, in both blocks, whether it is three in one block, three in one block is basically you actually do a femoral nerve block uh, with a larger volume. And uh, in both this block, uh, the all three nerves is only seen to be blocked in around probably 35, 33 to 35% of the patients. So if the local anesthetic actually spreads over the aliacus, that is a, a compartment A and C, that is when uh, you get a actual, uh, this is called perivascular approach to the lumbar plexus, a local anesthetic spreads. But if it spreads to uh, compartment A and B, then you will only get uh, the femoral and lateral cutaneous. Now femoral and lateral cutaneous is all fine for uh, providing analgesia, they are fine for surgeries like dynamic hip screw or uh, cannulated hip screw, but not as much for intramedullary, uh, you know, nailing or uh, hemiarthroplasty or total arthroplasty. So facial iliaca compartment block will be described by Ganesh. Uh, Ganesh is a senior consultant anesthesiologist working at Corona Hospital in Mumbai. And uh, his special interest is regional anesthesia and onchoanesthesia and orthopedic anesthesia as well, because wherever people are doing a, a regional anesthesia, they are associated with uh, orthopedic anesthesia as well. So over to you, Ganesh, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, you're, uh, you want- Yeah, to I would appreciate that. if you can just pause the video at that, yeah. yes, that at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's a simple block, but most of the, most of the time it is very underutilized block. We have to mark two points, that is anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. We have to ma mark a straight line joining these two points. And our point of entry is uh, joining point of joining point of uh, medial two-third and lateral two-third. Two One centimeter below that point, we enter. Now we can start the video, sir. I think you meant by uh, medial two-third and lateral one-third. Sorry, third. sorry, sorry. Medial two-third and lateral one-third. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And uh, one centimeter below this uh, point is our point of entry. We can uh, take a 22 gauge, one and a half inch needle, which has been uh, blunted in, uh, beforehand. And uh, uh, after uh, skin puncture, we can we have to appreciate the two pops. First is facial lata pop. And second is uh, here we can see the first pop going. And uh, then uh, I'm entering the second space that is, I'm uh, getting the second pop-up that is puncturing of the fascia iliaca. After careful aspiration, we can inject 20 mLs of 0.25% uh, bupiocaine or 0.375% uh, uh, ropiocaine. And uh, this backflow of the drug, which indicates that we our needle tip is in the proper uh, plane and not in, in the iliacus muscle. The palpation of the pubic tubercle uh, can be slightly painful in the patients who are not anesthetized. And this block can be used while giving position, uh, sitting position for the uh, spinal anesthesia in patients who are having, uh, who are being uh, operated for the neck femur fractures or post-operative analgesia in patients who are undergoing knee, knee arthroscopy or uh, small skin graftings uh, where the skin graft is, is taken from the anterior surface of the thigh. 
as well as the shaft fracture femurs, you can use it as a postoperative anesthesia. That's all I guess. Yeah, I, I think uh, again, uh, it is also one of the blocks which is directly used uh, in the accident and emergency department uh, for providing yeah. pain and uh, for hip fracture patients because it can be, these are mainly elderly patients, a um, lot of comorbidities, they need to be moved to x-rays and stuff. So it has been, uh, again, used by the any staff. They have been taught how to do these blocks. So these are one of the uh, on arrival blocks uh, for uh, pain relief yeah. uh, for that. Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, uh, I think you demonstrated very well that uh, uh, seeing the local anesthetic flow back uh, is an important indication because it's very easy uh, to be in muscle. And uh, if you're in muscle, injecting local anesthetic in the muscle, you won't uh, get the flow back uh, in that. It will get absorbed from there. Uh, so yeah, yeah. flow back is very, very important. And two pops, again, uh, you need to feel those two pops, first one going through facial atta and uh, second one through facial atta. Uh, very popular block, uh, you know, but again, you know, uh, like, I, like I said, it's uh, for, um, you know, uh, there is fun anesthesia for everything for lower limb, everybody who tends to use yes. it. Uh, but again, it can be combined with fun anesthesia for post-op because once, uh, the spinal anesthesia wears off if you know, especially if you're not using additives. Uh, this provides decent amount of analgesia. Very true. Uh, along with multimodal analgesia, uh, this actually provides a great block. Okay, okay thank I, you, Ganesh. I, and uh, yeah, coming to the ankle block, and um, this is uh, so we have gone from head to toe. So there we come. So five, five nerves, uh, obviously the perineal nerve supplies uh, the uh, web space, the medial plantar and little plantar, which are branches of the posterior tibial supply, uh, the sole of the foot, saphenous nerve supplies the medial part of the skin, sural on the little part of the skin and superficial perineal, the rest of it. Okay. So you can see how the deep area nerve is actually exactly coming out at the uh, in a web space, and uh, the you got the uh, superficial perineal, which gives the medial little branches, uh, supply most of the skin on uh, the dorsum of the foot, uh, sural nerve supplying the uh, little part, and the saphenous uh, supplying the medial part. So you can see that the four nerves supply most of the dorsum of the foot, and. Um, the one of the things which people tend to actually ask uh, quite a long time, or oh, where is the nerve? Is it uh, medial to the artery, lateral to the artery? Remember, and so the nerve lies between the artery and the tendon. Okay, so it lies lateral, where the artery is medial, and uh, so it lies lateral to the artery between the artery and the tendon, and. Uh, the other uh, nerve which lies in relation to the artery is the posterior tibial and that lies uh, behind the posterior tibial artery. And, and that is the main nerve of the sole of the foot. It gives out a calcaneal branch and which supplies the sole of uh, the uh, you know, a ball of the uh, foot and uh, then divides into medial plantar and lateral plantar nerve. So very, very important uh, nerve uh, for any surgery of which is happening. So Preeti is a concerned anesthesiologist uh, in private practice. Uh, she has special interest in regional analgesia, anesthesia, uh, blocks on arrival. She does anesthesia for trauma obstetric. And she's also uh, very much interested in uh, you know, uh, difficult airway, teaching difficult airway. Preeti? Yes, sir. Okay, over to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so that was no, your no. case. Yeah, ankle block is one of pretty much one of the best uh, blocks which requires the least amount of technical expertise. So we'll just hold on here. You okay? Yeah. It can be pretty much done on the worst of patients. You need not have a good ASA status. There is absolutely no hemodynamic instability. You have, one has to really, I don't know how can I, you know, put it in words. One has to really try their best to fail in this particular block. It's it's almost as good as impossible to fail. And over the last, I think three years, I must have done over 500 of them and it continues to remain my most uh, favorite block so far for all kinds of forefoot and, uh, you know, ahead the surgeries that are there. Um, also, 
yeah that's it that's the uh, this for the moment and uh, let's start sir okay here we go so you are all i'm doing is palpating the dorsalis pedis and the tendon and you go right between right in between as shiv sir said okay i'm using a one and a half inch needle the uh, nisora books do mention a 25 gauge needle but i'm pretty comfortable with the one and a half that comes with you know, a 10 ml uh, syringe what i use is i use a 0.5% ropivacaine uh, as my la once i'm done with the uh, superficial the deep peroneal nerve that is in front or uh, in front of the ankle i just fan out on both sides so as i go medially my uh, saphenous nerve is blocked and you go laterally for the lateral component yeah so you can call this either a ring block of the around the ankle or a field block yeah here again i prefer to go around the foot since we are at the end of the table rather than stand in one place i prefer to go around the foot so access to all the becomes very easy so here i'm going almost up to the lateral malleolus and i keep injecting my needle poke goes where i have already given the anesthetic before so it's less painful for the patient most of the patients coming up for uh, such uh, surgeries are diabetics or those with peripheral vascular disease peripheral neuropathies so there's not much of uh, you know uh, sensations around the place but when you're looking at an amputation a digital amputation or a ray amputation or even a four foot amputation which we have done under this block this is uh, where it is really very helpful because when you're cutting the bone you have to be very sure that the patient is blocked properly or else you are asking for hemodynamic problems for both the patient and for yourself surgeon doesn't really know what is going on anyways yeah now i've come medially palpating the posterior tibial artery and i go just behind that that is going to be where my uh, posterior tibial nerve is going to be and i give around 3 to 4 mils at every uh, major artery and i just go in a fan shaped yeah that's that's how i'm going again fan shaped from the uh, dorsalis pedis artery towards the medial side yeah so i'm going covering the area between the achilles tendon and the medial malleolus here again injection into the achilles tendon can cause problems can cause tendoachylitis patient can come with a ruptured achilles tendon but it's really really very difficult to inject into it and cause problems so iatrogenic problems of this particular uh, uh, block are really minimal here i'm going in for the sural nerve again i've basically i've just gone in the midpoint between the lateral malleolus and the calcaneum given about 3 mils there and finished off my fanning of the drug now this is important in patients with a diabetic foot especially because they may show you uh, an abscess at one place and as you go deeper you find that the pus has actually trickled in between the tendons so we have you know often we see patients where the surgical surgeon has inserted his artery from the dorsum of the foot and actually comes out from the uh, sole so here this is where this field block is extremely important so it covers the whole foot and it gives beautiful analgesia yeah, even post operatively so patients are awake you can keep them awake if you wish it, it, it i use it as a sole anesthetic or if my patients are younger or anxious about so many needle pricks or if they have any sensations then uh, that is when i choose to sedate the patient so sedation you may decide uh, as per your personal choice or whatever is available some midas fentanyl some people like some ketodex going on some people just want some sevoren to go to the patient oxygen sevoflurane whatever it is that you want to give or you can just uh, give the block and do away with it that's it sir a very short present yeah no no that was short short and sweet as usual and um, it's always uh, i think your lecture is always the last one uh, priti but i think uh, it always uh, the best one still keeps people awake <laughs> i'm forever <laughs> grateful for people to actually you know who wait up and listen to my talks and then give me such no. feedback yeah, that's it so you always uh, finish the talk <laughs> and so we yeah any any questions by anyone uh, uh, may uh, may i ask one yeah. question priti yeah yeah uh, yeah do you think this was a very good case for uh, ankle block because i could see lot of infection around the joint uh, at the injection site so 
so uh, actually they say na that you should avoid giving uh, uh, or, uh, the presence of infection because it does i do see a lot of infection around the joint uh, at the injection site you know mobile phone and i think uh, it Achha. was full volume uh, so it was just repeating that yeah uh, i think that is not infection chitra that is like just excoriation right. you see yes. that's okay. like it's very that's very common in diabetic patients uh, okay but that was quite lot of edema on the ankle absolutely, absolutely. you see it lot it can extend all, almost up to the uh, knee in some cases yeah true but, but that's what i said that in such yeah. patients actually they say yeah. that it's better to avoid uh, ankle block it is only fluid it's only fluid it's not infection hmm. yeah. i mean this particular patient this patient was picked off the streets and brought to our hospital so actually i have not sent those videos only in the pictures you can see all that uh, those you know patches of what looks like infection but this guy actually had live maggots in his foot oh so my god was okay. yeah everything was on his fore foot we had no medical history from the patient he was disoriented for a while and because he had so much of infection we thought of you know surgeon thought of debridement so we had a neuro assessment we had all the other you know cardiologist opinion everybody saw him and then he was brought for surgery but since he was highly unstable we had around 8 to 10% of ejection fraction on uh, to uh, the echo we decided to i at least i prefer to do everything under blocks as far as possible now what yeah, but then in such patients is better to go higher na no? uh, that's because the surgery also may extend uh, a little because it was quite a vast area uh, which was involved the surgeon wanted to only debride the uh, foot area the fore foot he did not want to go up there was no edema what looks like edema is actually thickening of the skin over there Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. those white patches that were there they were all previous infections which had already dried up okay mm-hmm. okay no yeah it looks different on uh, this you know on the video but yeah. it was all free yeah from- but in video it was really it was a bit scary in mean, the uh, <laughs> it, uh, yeah. so yeah. but otherwise in such patients i prefer to go higher up yeah. so that yeah. there isn't any spread of uh, yes 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 it, but here again course, of uh, you know patients in fact even when you're doing uh, uh, toenail uh, removals or uh, toe uh, abscesses that come up sometimes there is so much of edema it is not possible to give a ring block around the toe or something no no ring block is okay that that i'm not talking just uh, at the ankle because i'm more worried of spreading the infection up uh, yeah. and uh, because of and uh, the there is any amount of cellulitis if there is pus anywhere around the inj- area of injection we do not do that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but it wasn't so bad actually you know the patient's other general condition was far worse than what was seen on the video it's like that okay thank you i, I think uh, there aren't any more um, i think questions uh, and uh, can i ask you need to uh, thank all the faculty um, before i stop sharing uh, the uh, but i need slides. to say something sir yeah one second one second uh, you know we not finished yet <laughs> sir one question so is you just thanking it is you i will allow you all all to at least sir so no sir actually yeah. you don't actually i just wanted to say this that you know my 